Okei. Tervetuloa seuraamaan RTVn maailmankuvia sarjaa. Tänään meillä on arvovaltainen vieras Yhdysvalloista, Tom Campbell. Seuraava keskustelu tullaan käymään englannin kielellä. So, hello Tom. It's nice to have you here and it's a great honor to us. Well, thank you for inviting me, Timo. Well, it's always a pleasure listening to a wise man and I think you are the one. <laughs> Perhaps uh, you would like to uh, tell a little bit about yourself, that example you are uh, telling uh, how did you become a nuclear physicist and how did you end up going to that uh, MPT and becoming the, a spiritual teacher? Okay. <clears throat> well, I'll try. That's a very long story, but I'll try to make it a shorter story. We have a time. <laughs> for, your, for your audience. I'm a physicist. And uh, in the process of uh, working on my PhD in graduate school, I, <clears throat> I learned how to do transcendental meditation. And the reason I learned transcendental meditation was because it promised that I could get by with less sleep. And as a graduate student doing experimental nuclear physics, I was a, uh, a slave to a very large Van de Graaff generator that produced uh, particles going very fast that we'd smash into other particles. And when that big machine was running, you took data. You didn't go to sleep. You didn't get, you know, say, well, another, tomorrow's another day and start up in the morning. When that thing was working and working well, then the scientists working with it would stay there and work with it um, as long as they could to get their data. So the need to work sometimes for two and three days in a row without sleep um, was uh, something I needed. And I saw an advertisement for, for transcendental meditation and they promised to help solve that problem. So I was interested. So I, I, I went to a course uh, that was given there at the university and <clears throat> it was very easy for me. They gave me a mantra and almost instantly, I just lost consciousness. I started saying my mantra, and like 45 minutes later, I thought I'd only been there for maybe a minute or two, and realized after looking at my watch that 45 minutes had gone by. So I was kind of a natural for the meditation. And after about three months of meditation, I guess following a hunch or just giving things a try, because after all, I was an experimentalist, which means you tend to just try things and see what happens. I tried looking at my uh, computer code that I was writing to try to find the errors, the bugs in it. And I found that I could just let that computer code scroll by just like it would on a printout of the computer code. And the lines of code that were uh, 
that had errors in them would be red and all the rest was in black on white paper. So I noticed that and was very surprised and said, oh, isn't that interesting? All right, let me look at that line. And I looked at that line and, and uh, indeed I found an error in it. So I let it scroll some more. And after about a half an hour of just playing with this, because I was just playing, um, I, went to the, I went to the lab where I worked. I got my computer code out and started looking for those lines of code in my boxes of cards, which is what we did in those days. And sure enough, those lines that appeared red to me had errors in them. And indeed, I found all the errors in the deck. So the next time I ran it, it ran flawlessly. And that was a very big deal. We didn't have the kind of error correcting uh, online interactive, you know, with the computer that didn't exist back in, you know, 1968, 69, 70, you know, and that's what I'm talking about in those days. So that was very important. And I worked at that. I, I did that. Um, from then on, that's how I tried to debug my programs because I could get more done and more and done more accurately in 10 minutes in a meditation state than I could spending three or four days trying to find them manually. So that was a big, big aha moment for me. As a scientist, I had the idea that reality could be defined by what I called an operational definition, which means that if you could make, if you could do an operation there, another way of saying that, if you could make a measurement, if it was measurable, then it was real. If you couldn't measure it and taking a measurement is an operation. So they call this an operational definition. If you can do something with it, then it's real. If you can't, then it's not real. It's either imaginary or it's irrelevant if it's in some other class. So that was my idea with, of uh, reality. But suddenly I was doing things of which there was no way to make a measurement. There was no physical process going on. It was strictly a mental process. And I was able to do things that were <clears throat> impossible that shouldn't have been able to be done. So that opened up my reality. And from then on, I realized that, um, you know, as a physicist, what I do is I model reality. That's what physics is. It makes models of reality, usually mathematical models of reality. And here I had been working in only a subset of the larger reality. That reality was, a, was actually bigger than that. It also contained a world that was a mental world, a... Um, what I would call a non-physical world. Now I saw the mental world pretty much as non-physical because you couldn't go in and measure, you know, things in just a mental world. All of that is subjective. The, the world that's measurable, the real world in my, in my previous uh, thinking was the objective world. So the subjective world was not part of that real world. So now, I had another whole reality that I needed to learn about, that I needed to model, that I needed to understand, because that was my drive as a, as a young physicist in my middle to late 20s. So I um, kept meditating, kept trying to explore, what could I do with, else could I do with this meditation, and so on. And when I got out of graduate school, took a job, I just happened to run into uh, Bob Monroe. Well, I didn't really run into him. I ran into his book first. And a bunch of us where I worked ran into his book. And my idea of his book was that, wow, this is really interesting because I'm aware that there is a larger reality. And Bob seemed to have gotten around in one. And are those two the same? Or is he just some guy wanting to make some money on the side by you know, making stuff up and selling books? So when uh, one of the people I worked with uh, tracked Bob down and found out that he lived in uh, an area that was close enough to our area to go visit. So we called him up, made an arrangement to go see him, and two cars packed full of 
engineers and scientists pretty much went out to see Bob Monroe just to see, is, was this guy for real or was he a hustler? You know, that was my idea, you know, because if he's for real, then I'm interested because I know there's this larger reality and maybe he has a key and I should study that. So I found out, of course, that he was a very real, genuine person. He wasn't trying to just make money to sell books. He already was very wealthy and the money he got from books was beside the point. And he was trying very hard to make his experience of out of body uh, a, uh, a science, uh, something that was credible, something that wasn't just a weird thing that happened to him. So he, had, he was looking for some scientists to help man a consciousness lab that he had just constructed and was ready to do something with it, but didn't know how. So he had the facility, but didn't have any scientists or really any way of knowing what to do next. And uh, myself and a, a friend, Dennis Menerick, here we were, young people in our, in our uh, late 20s. And we uh, were real interested in studying what Bob and Rowe had experienced. Was there a way to make this a science? Was there a way to teach it? Was there a way that uh, you know, the average person could experience this? Or was it just special people that this happened to? So we had these ideas and we weren't quite sure that you know, this was going to be a good thing. But uh, Dennis and I both thought, well, if this turns bad, which means it turns into a belief trip rather than real science, you know, that we would just leave. But as long as there was promise of it being real science and maybe we would learn more about this larger reality, we were in. So that began my association with Bob and Rowe, which lasted then for about a decade. And then I became a, a kind of a board of directors or whatever with the, with the Monroe Institute. But at the, the first five or six years, there was no Monroe Institute. That hadn't happened yet. This was just the very beginning days with, with Bob Monroe before the Monroe Institute, uh, back at a, a, a land that was called the Whistlefield Farm, which is not at all where the Monroe Institute is today. So this is kind of pre-Monroe Institute. Well, um, Bob did teach Dennis and I how to experience these altered states and basically go out of body. So he taught us that, and he taught us that being very careful never to lead us, but it had to be self-discovery. You had to discover it on your own, otherwise it wasn't going to happen. It wasn't a matter of following his direction. It was a matter of he'd give you some things to try, and you'd have to work at them and learn on your own. So we did that. And because I was the physicist, my job was to, kind of, was to figure out how did it work? What's the theory? What was going on? Where was this other reality? What could you do in it? What couldn't you do in it? What were its limitations? What was its fundamental theoretical constructs? That was my job. And Dennis was an electrical engineer, and he and I both um, designed and built lab equipment. You know, uh, GSR, we, we outfitted Bob's lab with GSR, galvanic skin response to measure skin, um, skin conductivity. We also uh, were able to get hold of an EEG that we could look at brain waves. So uh, we looked at uh, very high impedance input uh, voltmeters. So you could look, look at the, the voltage between different parts of the body, uh, different parts, maybe the head or even hands or whatever, and see if that had any effect. And indeed, we worked at this for years. And uh, it was somewhere between a, you know, 15 to 20 hours a week, like halftime job. So that was the night job. So Dennis and I both worked uh, the same place. Actually, it was, a, it was an Army Technical Intelligence is where we worked. The organization called FSTC, Farm Science and Technology Center. It's changed its name a couple of times since then um, with various reorganizations. They, <laughs> these things tend to change their names. But um, anyhow, um, so that was our, we had a day job and a, and a night job. And that was a time when I was putting lots and lots of hours into studying this larger consciousness system, you know, beyond the physical system that I'd studied as a physicist, trying to understand it. And I found that as I could go out of body 
very precisely, which means when I wanted to, where I wanted to, how I wanted to, and then I could repeat it pretty much exactly. When I got good enough to do that, I was able to do experiments there. So I could do an experiment and let's say I was remote viewing or healing or doing one of those things that's evidential. See, remote viewing is good to do because it's evidential. Either get your target right or you don't. You know, you can see what's going on at some other place or you don't. And the descriptions would have to be very, very good. Healing is not quite as evidential because there's a strong uh, um, uh, uncertainty. You know, uh, what should I say? Um, random component to it. If you work on somebody to heal them and then they get suddenly healed, well, they may have just got suddenly healed anyway. You know, that just happens. You, know, you can't take credit for that. So you have to do it enough and then maintain statistics on it so that you can say, you know, what's the probability that it could have just happened anyway? And what's the probability that uh, you did something um, beyond what could happen ordinarily? That's called statistical significance. So we, we, kept, we kept records to see how you know, statistically significant we were in doing these things. We read numbers off of blackboards. Dennis and I went on a trip together where we both went out of body, met someplace, and then went out on a trip. And of course, we're both speaking into microphones and Bob's recording it all in a, in, at the control room and to see whether we actually were, you know, saying, seeing the same thing. Now, we were in independent booths where, that were completely acoustically isolated from each other. So I couldn't hear him. He couldn't hear me. The booth I was in was also uh, completely electromagnetically shielded. It was a Faraday cage, you know, solid metal all the way around, uh, welded down the seams and then grounded so that it was a, a big ground plane that kept any electromagnetic energy from traveling in or out of that. So we were completely isolated from each other. So Anyway, these are the kinds of experiments we did. And we could repeat a lot of these experiments. I could repeat at least the ones that I was doing singly myself. I could repeat these, change a variable, do it again. What difference did that variable make? Uh, change that variable a little more, do it again. What difference did that make? And so on, and then change a different variable. So 35 years later or so, I kind of had the idea that I understood some of the basics about consciousness. So I was trying to understand this world of consciousness because this was a, a non-physical world where all the action seemed to take place. It takes place internally in mind space or thought space, in feeling space, but it's all subjective space that um, I just call consciousness. So I was really researching consciousness and out of body and remote viewing, those were just tools. They were just things that I could use to decide whether I was understanding it or not understanding it, because those were applications with evidence to see whether you, you were doing it well or doing it not. So in my mind, this was always science. I was working on um, subjective science, if you will, and the way you work on subjective science is with statistics. You have to do it and do it and do it over and over again to where it's repeatable and reliable. And then you know you have something. So once it's, if it's objective, you just have to do it. You know, one or two people have to do the same experiment, get the same answer and you're done. But when it's subjective, you have to do it over and over and over again to make sure that you're not making something up that you're not, uh, you know, it's not coming from inside of your own head or your own mind. So it's a little harder to, to prove that to yourself. And being a scientist, it was very difficult for me to prove that to myself. But I did eventually. And anyway, so I'm doing this. And about 35 years later, I write these books, My Big Toe, which were kind of uh, what have I learned in the last 35 years of doing experiments in you know, what I call the larger consciousness system. And how does consciousness work? And what's its nature? And who are we? And sort of a what is consciousness? And, and I, I did this. And basically what I, what I had was a, a whole, was a set of, of facts 
that I had created in the world of consciousness. Now, these are, these are things that I created just from my own experience, my own research. And I, these were reliable. They always work. They were evidential. So they were facts. And I had a bunch of facts that were physical facts that were facts from my physics, right? Facts of the real world. So I wanted to build this model that would contain both because reality is a whole thing. It's not two separate things. It's a whole thing. So some of the facts I learned about in consciousness, I knew that one of the facts was that consciousness was fundamental and that the physical world was derivative. It was not fundamental because I could do things in the conscious world that would directly affect the, the physical world. But I couldn't do that the other way around. The things that happen in a physical world do not directly affect the conscious world. They indirectly affect it sometimes, but they don't directly affect it. So it's not the flow. The causal flow is from consciousness to the physical, not the other way. So that meant consciousness was primary. So I knew that in this one big model of everything was really going to be at first, just a model of consciousness. And if that model of consciousness was complete, it would also have to be able to derive physics from it because that was the superset. And the physical world was the subset. So physics needed to be able to be derived from consciousness. So I wrote my books, which were basically a model of consciousness. Though I was aware when I wrote them that they also contained what was required to develop physics from the scratch, you know, from the ground up. So about, um, oh, two years or so after I published these books, I published them in 2003. So about 2005 or so, I had an aha moment that, oh, I see how this consciousness theory directly uh, lets me understand the double slit experiment. Oh, how did I miss that? You know, I mean, that was so obvious once I saw it, that it was like, geez, you know, that uh, you know, I kind of hit myself in the head a little bit and said, I should have seen that right away, but I didn't. But then I did. So then I said, well, if I can solve quantum mechanics, if I can really derive quantum mechanics and make quantum mechanics, not a weird science, but a rational science, just like all other science, you know, a, a logical science, a science that if you understand the logic of it, you can understand uh, what the results are going to be. You can understand the, the science. Whereas now, physicists see quantum mechanics as a weird science. It's a science that's not intuitive. It's not logical. Things just happen, but it's not a logical process. It's a mathematical process. You just do the math and you get the answer. So, but you can't really understand. That's what Feynman said, nobody will really be able to understand in the normal sense of the word understand, that's kind of quote unquote from Feynman, you know, how quantum physics works. It's beyond our understanding. So I never liked that idea. I don't, you know, what do you mean? You know, it's non-logical and beyond our understanding. That just means we don't understand it yet. That's all that means, you know, we, you know instead of taking the responsibility that's ours to figure out to say, oh, no, it's not ours to figure out. It's impossible. Nobody can figure it out. Well, I always saw that as a cop out. And uh, well, I saw it and I saw how to do it. Quantum mechanics is a logical science. And I could look at the quantum mechanics experiments and I could just logically see how they were working. And I could predict what would be the outcome just by looking at the logic of the experiment. You know, it wasn't that hard to do. I didn't have to do the calculations to understand it. So then I th thought, well, gee, if I've got that one, what about relativity? You know, quantum mechanics and relativity, that just about sums up science these days. You know, everything basically falls out of those two big ideas. Well, I looked at that for just maybe an hour or two until I got the aha moment on that too. And well, of course, I got to understand relativity. The big secret in relativity is why is the speed of light a constant? That's the big secret. If you know that the speed of light is indeed is a constant, then everything else is just a matter of doing the algebra. Matter of fact, special relativity is not even hard math. It's just, you know, 
high school level algebra, you can, you can work out that, that problem. Now, general relativity that takes in gravity, that's a little more complex mathematically, but still the fundamental thing that makes relativity work is that C is a constant because nothing else works that way. See, that means if you have a source of light and it's moving across here very fast and you turn it on, that light, even though the source is moving, the light still just goes the speed of light. Whereas everything else, if you have something with a moving source and then you eject something out of it, it's got the velocity of the source and the velocity that you gave to it when you ejected it. Those two add, not with light. Nothing goes faster than the speed of light. Well, that was also trivial. And it's both of them came when I really understood the concept of this reality that we're in being an information-based reality. That's the key. If you understand our physical reality, our physical universe as a information-based reality, then understanding quantum physics and why C is a constant just falls out. It's, it's a logical consequence of this being an information-based reality. Now, another word for information-based reality is that this is a computed reality or a virtual reality. All of those words mean basically the same thing. And for instance, the, well, I don't know, maybe we won't go into that yet. I'll let you ask the question if you want to dig deeper. I'm just skimming along the surface here for now. So I did that. I looked at other questions as well. Questions um, in some of them were psychology, neuroscience. Um, uh, Oh, let's see, what were some of the other ones? Um, some other physics, a bunch of other physics problems. I looked at all these problems that we had gotten to in science that were called paradoxes. There was, and there was a lot of them in physics. You get to a point where you say, all right, we know that reality is this way because we do experiments and that's the way it is. But we have no idea why it should be that way. It's a paradox. Paradox basically just means that you don't understand. You have no idea why things happen the way they happen. You have no theory to get from the, you know, A to B. There's no theory that connects those two. You just know that uh, the transition happens, but you don't know why. So I was able to solve all those paradoxes. I could look at them and say, all right, from this perspective of virtual reality, I can understand all the paradoxes. So now I had a consciousness theory that derived physics because the consciousness theory derived this as a virtual reality. And <clears throat> that means that, that I have some, you know, maybe I'll just go through a couple of, of uh, statements here. I won't derive them because that would take more time unless you want to, and we want to go into more detail later. Yes. And that is that consciousness is information. Okay. Consciousness is nothing more than information. What are you conscious of? Well, that's information. So what are we conscious of in this reality is what we see, hear, smell, taste, feel. We have five senses. Those five senses take in data. That data is our reality. That data describes our reality, I should say. Okay, so reality is information. Consciousness is information. Consciousness is a system. It, therefore, it's an information system. An information system, we think of that term as applying to computers. Well, that's a pretty good application. That, uh, this information system, this larger consciousness system, can configure parts of itself as a computer if it likes, because it's just a general information system. It's an information system that is conscious. So we start with we start with that and we come to the idea that consciousness evolves, information systems evolve by lowering their entropy. Now what that means is if you have an information system with a certain number of bits, if all those bits are random, there's no information. So the way you gain information in this information system is by ordering those bits 
in some meaningful way. So when you produce order from the chaos, you create information. A measurement of disorder is called entropy. A lot of disorder, a lot of entropy. Low disorder or more order, then you have lower entropy. So lowering entropy creates information. That's how information systems evolve. They grow the quality, quality of their information, of their information, information or they can de-evolve, which, which means become, become more random. random. And if they do evolve enough, enough, then they're no they're longer, longer information, information systems. System. They're back to they're all, back to all you know, random, you know, random bits, bits again. again. So to survive, so to survive an information, information system, system that is conscious, that is conscious needs, to keep needs to keep evolving. evolving. And as it turns, and as it turns out, out, I'm skipping, I'm a, whole skipping a whole bunch of steps here, but we can go back and pick them up if you like. It turns out that the way, the way a, a consciousness, consciousness system, system and, and individuated units of consciousness, of consciousness are just pieces, are just of, pieces that of that consciousness system, system. the way such the a way system, such system evolves, evolves by lowering its entropy, and that is, and that is equivalent, equivalent to, to the parts, the, parts, the individuated units of consciousness, consciousness cooperating, with each, cooperating with each other. And I can make a can logical, make a logical derivation, derivation of that, so it's just so clear deductive, deductive logic, logic from one step from one to the step other, to but, the I'm other but I'm just making just this making statement this now. Statement now. That, that consciousness, consciousness evolves, evolves by lowering its entropy, entropy, and that is the, that same, is the same as consciousness, as consciousness must grow, must grow to, become to become more cooperative, more caring, more sharing, more compassionate. And I take and all I those take things all those and drop them, them in under one under name, one called, name called, love. called love. So, so to, to evolve, consciousness, evolve consciousness, has consciousness has to become love. Become love. And it's not, and it's not act, more, act loving. more loving. That's nice, That's but, nice but, be but be more loving. More it's a being it's a thing. thing. It actually has it actually to... Has to Change it, change it. That's, that's how consciousness evolves. evolves. And that's kind of how kinda all of this that I've been talking about sounds kind of very science up, up, up in the beginning. You know, it's, it's all trial, trial and error and error experiment, experiment and do and, and do models. models. But, but basically, basically, it takes it us back to the point that this larger consciousness system is the source. Yes. Of all of that all we know that, we that, know exists. that exists, it's the source. It's, the source. Mm-hmm. it's non-physical to us because information is non-physical. Some people Some will people say, oh, no, say, oh, no, there's there's information's physical. physical. There's a book, there's and, a it's book and it's full of information, and it's physical. No, the book, no, the book is, full is full of data. data. The book is full, book of, is code full of code symbols. Ink, ink paper. paper. Those squiggles, Those squiggles of, ink of ink on the paper, on the paper are, symbols. are symbols. They mean they things. Mean things. Okay. Okay. Yeah. That's the way we can take information and convert it into data. But it takes a consciousness to have, to have information. information. Okay, that okay, means that, that, means a, that until, until a consciousness, a consciousness looks, at looks at those words, words in, that in that book and, and interprets, interprets them, them to mean something, something information, information is created, created when, that when that consciousness interprets, interprets those, those symbols, symbols into meaning. meaning. So, so Information, information is the, is the content, content, not the code, not the symbols. code symbols. Ink, Ink is, not is not information. Paper is not information. Information, information, information is, the is the content, content. The, significance, the significance, the meaning, the meaning that, that, that book has. Book has. You see? You see. Mm-hmm. So, so that meaning, that meaning only, only is available, is available to, a to a conscious. So, so I, write I write a book. A book. I, have I have information. information. I, convert I convert that information, that information, information into, into code, code symbols, symbols and I put them on paper. I take that paper and I send it to you. You You get that that and you have to look at those code code symbols symbols and interpret it it back into into information. information. But now now, it's not not a perfect perfect process process because because I take my information and and, 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 uh, in a a non-precise, a a non-perfect process, process, turn it into code symbols. Exactly. exactly what I'm what telling, I'm telling you, you may have a lot of feeling and other things, things in it. And, and code, code, symbols, code, symbols, code symbols, symbols are really, really hard. hard. I can describe, I can describe it, it, but that's, that's the best, the best I, can I can do. You can't, you can't ever really get my, my information, information directly. directly. You can only, you can only get, get my information, information put into put code. In the code. You get the code and you have to decode it based on your you know, what, you know what's, what's in you, in your, experience, your experience, your education, your, education, your ignorance, your fear, your fear whatever, whatever it is that makes you up now is going to be part of how you decode, decode that. that. So, so 
There's my encoding, encoding that is an imprecise, imprecise process. There's your decoding, decoding as an internet, internet, imprecise process. process. But, we but we do that because, because when we when code, we code it, it and turn it into data, data, we can we move can it around. Move around. As long as, as it's, it's just, just information, information it's, it's stuck in our in head. head. We have, we to, have describe to describe it, it put it in code, code and, then and then whether that whether code, that code is, our is our spoken words, words or, whatever or whatever it is, it is it, 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 then, we, then spread we spread it to somebody, somebody else. else. So it allows, so it allows us, us to share information, information save information, 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 store information. It's all done in code symbols. The information is the meaning. It exists just inside consciousness. So we have... A larger, a larger consciousness, consciousness system, system that's, that's the source, the source. Mm -hmm. okay. okay and, and all, the content, all the content all the meaning all the things, all the things that, are that are there that support, support our consciousness, consciousness and that derive our physical, physical reality. reality it, it needs, needs to evolve to do that, do that it, needs it needs to lower, lower its entropy, entropy which, which means it needs to grow up it needs to improve the quality of that, of that content, content that it's that got, it's got. Improve, improve the value, value of that content, content. That, that lowers, lowers the, entropy. the entropy that makes, makes you have, have more value there, there. more order the, the, the order, order means, means more, more. Okay. okay so, so that's, that's significant. significant so it, so it does, does that and it found that the way that happens is through choice it's a consciousness what it does is make choices so consciousness does it chooses to do this rather than do that it, it makes choices. choices. It chooses, chooses to, to talk to A rather than B, B or A and B together, together whatever. whatever. Those, Those are all choices. Consciousness, consciousness makes choices. choices. And, and by, by the quality of those choices, choices whether, whether those choices, choices are low entropy, entropy choices, choices or high entropy choices, choices. in other words, that choice leads to higher entropy or that choice leads to lower entropy, then the consciousness evolves or de-evolves based on whether it's making high entropy or low entropy choices. Well, well, the first, the first thing, thing it had to do is that when it got, got to the point of being, being a, it's, it's just, just one big monolithic, monolithic consciousness, consciousness, it ran into stagnation. stagnation. You can you only do, do so much. much. And, and just, just like cells did here, it broke, broke itself into pieces, pieces so, so it could interact, interact with those pieces. pieces. Because two pieces of consciousness, both with free will choices, can interact, interact in many different, different ways that are unforeseeable because you have two free will things interacting. How, the, how, how they, will they will each make choices is unknown until they make those choices. choices. And, and if you have hundreds of free will things interacting, interacting the possibilities of how that could all go together become immense. And if you have millions of them, then the possibilities of how all of that could work out become immense. So it gives us more growing room in order to evolve. So that's, that's what happened in consciousness. And in order to get those pieces of consciousness, um, a, a better grade of choices, more meaningful, more, more um, um, can we say, more useful choices, choices that have consequences, meaningful choices, not just choices like, oh, let's talk about baseball. No, let's talk about football. No, let's, you know, let's play a game of cards. You know, those Choices are not all that meaningful as far as our growth goes in becoming love. So it needed a context in which the choices had more significance. And that's why it created the physical reality that we call our physical universe. It created a virtual reality we call our physical universe. And it didn't program it. It got a set of initial conditions and you might not remember those or notice those from the Big Bang Theory as a, as a ball of plasma, high pressure, high temperature, all squeezed up in a tight little ball, and a rule set that said how that ball would expand, you know, how those things interacted, how that plasma would interact with itself. That's the rule set. So you have initial conditions and a rule set. The rule set's what we call physics, chemistry, biology. It's all the basic rules of how things interact with each other, how energy gets transmitted from one thing to another, how things affect each other, how we interact. So it had this rule set, it had the initial conditions, it hits the run button, and then it waits and sees what happens. Well, 
It probably ran for a little while and bombed. That's the way most computer programs work when they're first done. So then it rearranges it, you know, change the rules a little bit, uh, tighten that gravity up a little, you know, do this uh, a little different initial conditions, try it again. And it kept doing that until it had a stable simulation that would last long enough for that simulation to evolve a context in which consciousness could have more important, more significant choices. So it evolved critters, and we're one of them. It evolved humans, homo sapiens, and you know, this is how it worked up here. It's follow evolution. So we have these homo sapiens now, and consciousness could log on and make the choices of those homo sapiens. Just like you log on and make the choices of your barbarian or your elf or your magic user in you know, some virtual reality game. Mm -hmm. It's the same thing. So consciousness logs on and it makes all the choices for the player. And yes. that's the nature of virtual reality. Mm -hmm. Virtual reality don't really exist by themselves. They're just constructions made in a computer. But the computer has to exist and the player has to exist. So you have really, it's a talk, it's a conversation, a, a dance between the player and the computer. The computer just computes the context in which the player gets to make choices. So the computer uses the rule set of the virtual reality to compute what happens in the virtual reality. And the player gets to make all the choices of his character, how his character interacts with other characters. Computer tracks all that, computes according to the rule set, what the consequences are of those uh, uh, choices are. And that's how the game is played. Okay, so now let me point out why that solves quantum physics. That solves quantum physics because if this is a virtual reality and we are consciousness and this body, this body here whose lips are moving and, and uh, you know, making acoustic vibrations, which now we're sharing electronically in this physical world, you know, this body's just an avatar. And I'm a consciousness playing this particular avatar. That means just like in the world of Warcraft or Sims or whatever virtual reality game is popular these days, that means that all of the, let me say it, everything that's, the, everything that is important, all the information in that virtual reality is really in the minds of the players. Okay. In other words, the only way, if you in World of Warcraft see a, a forest, well, you see that forest because the computer sent your computer a data stream. And when you looked at the data and interpreted it, that looked like a forest to you. It's really a bunch of pixels on your screen, but that, those pixels look like a forest. So you get the data in the data stream, that shows you there's a forest there in that, in that virtual reality. There really is no forest somewhere in a, in a little space where elves and barbarians run around and, and fight with each other. That doesn't really exist. It's just information. All the information in the game exists in the computer and the minds of the players. Every player interprets the data according to his own experience, his own knowledge, his own fear, his own ignorance. You know, you don't, Everybody doesn't interpret the data exactly the same way. So everyone in the game actually has their own, living in their own little reality inside the bounds of that game. Okay, so the only way to get something in that game, like a forest or a rock, is to put it in a data stream. And until a player gets that data in a data stream, that stuff doesn't exist in the virtual reality until some player gets that, that woods data, that forest data, then that forest doesn't really exist in the game. But now once the computer says, oh, there's a forest sitting over here at these coordinates, in order to make a good virtual reality, you can't have that forest there for some players and no forest for other players. It has to be consistent. 
That's what makes a good virtual reality. It has to be consistent. So once it puts that in the game, it has to stay in the game. So if the computer decides, well, we'll have a forest over here on this part of the map, it can do that. It doesn't actually exist in the game until a player gets that information. And after that, then it always will stay in the game because it's part of the part of the map now. All right, well, that solves the measurement problem in quantum physics. Why is it that when a person looks and takes a measurement of what slit the particle goes through, when they take that measurement, they just get a particle that hits the screen right behind the slit that they measured, okay? That's because when they make a measurement and they get a measurement, they're getting data from the computer that says there's this thing here, that's the measurement. Once they do that, that creates the particle, if you will. The measurement creates the particle. The particle's just information, but the measurement puts the information in the game. So that particle becomes part of our physical reality when it's measured. And then it can't do anything other than what particles do, travel in a straight line unless interacted by an outside force and hit in a pile right behind a slit. That's what particles do. If there is no one measuring what, part, what slit it goes through, the particles will, will go through one slit or the other and they will hit the back screen because that's, the, that's where another measurement's taken. And then as the particle hits that screen, there will be a little flash of light there in this experiment. And therefore that's a measurement. We're measuring a particle. Well, then the system has to put that particle somewhere on that screen. How is it going to put it on the screen? Does it just put it on there randomly? We know that from our experiments, we know what it does. It puts all those particles in a thing called a, a, a pattern. You could either call it a fraction pattern or a wave pattern. It's, it's, a, um, uh, it's a pattern of, if you have slits, it's a pattern of stripes. Everybody's probably seen that in, in these double slit experiments. It's a pattern where you have a lot of particles, then you don't have any. Then you have more, then you don't have any. It's a series of slits. So that's what it does. It puts them in that pattern. Why would it put them in that pattern? Because that, that, kinda, that is something that would be consistent with optics. If it didn't put them in that pattern, there'd be an inconsistency between quantum, quantum mechanics and optics. So the system simply says, okay, here's a part that's going to hit the screen. Where am I going to put it? It takes a random draw from a probability distribution, and that probability distribution looks like a diffraction pattern, a, part, you know, a wave pattern. It takes a random draw from that, which means it picks one of those possibilities in that pattern and that's where it puts that particle on the screen. Next particle comes up, nobody's measuring it. Well, it has to put it someplace. It takes a random draw from that same pattern. And that's where it puts it. And when it's done, the particles on the screen look like that pattern because they've been taken out of that distribution. So that's how it's done. So why does a making a measurement matter? Why is it that when somebody comes and makes a measurement? Because that's how particles come into the game. See, so the, the measurement that's made at the screen has to have a, a rule for making it. And the ones that get measured at the slit also have a rule for making it. Each time where there's a measurement, there has to be a particle. So that's why there is this measurement effect. That's why the observer has an impact on what he observes. That's the big mystery of quantum mechanics. And the quantum physicists realized that that could be solved mathematically by assuming that particles are probability distributions. And if you assume that they're probability distributions, then you can correctly predict the result, okay? But that's the big mystery. Well, why, why should particles be probability distributions? Nobody has a clue. Well, in a virtual reality, it has to be produced. Our virtual reality is produced statistically with probability. That's how it's produced. It's not a virtual reality built from the bottom up. That is 
kind of a ridiculous concept. In other words, we don't first make virtual you know, subatomic particles, and then all the virtual subatomic particles make virtual atomic particles, which then all those go together and make virtual um, you know, bigger particles, uh, molecules. And all of those go together to make the stuff that we call physical. So we don't make this virtual reality from the bottom up. We use the rule set to create probability distributions that then allow us to create this physical reality out of probability, because that is a pretty small computer science problem compared to, the, to doing it from the ground up. The top down is reasonable, still a big problem to make this whole physical universe, but not one that's unthinkable, one that's, yeah, sure, that's doable. Matter of fact, our virtual realities are getting about as real as these, you know, so it's not, we're getting pretty good at that too, making realities at that level, but they're made statistically. Just like uh, what's the was thing was a real big deal and it was a disappointment called No Man's Sky. That was a, a virtual reality game published maybe three or four years ago. And it, uh, the whole thing can be done on a relatively small computer and it's quintillions of, un of, of uh, planets and each planet is unique. And the things that it has on that planet, whether it has life and what kind of life and what kind of fauna, uh, all of that is done on the fly as you look at it. It's computed when you have a user that's looking at it. They need the data stream. And as soon as nobody needs that data stream, it's not computed anymore. That's the same way our reality is computed. So we look, we get a data stream. If we don't make a measurement, looking is the same as making a measurement. If we don't make a measurement, then there's no need to make a data stream. So there, there is not a computer sitting there making particles or a World of Warcraft making elves and trees and rocks and things that are just sitting there waiting for somebody to join. There's nothing sitting there. Those things are interpretations of data that the players make. So as soon as you get that, then you realize, okay, that explains quantum physics. All you need is a new perspective. That's the whole thing. Science just needs to see the world from a new perspective. And there's per the perspective of virtual reality makes it a logical idea. Now, what about the, the speed of light? Well, any virtual reality has a top speed, and that is moving one pixel of distance every pixel of time. If you move two or five or 10 or 100 pixels of distance for one pixel of time, now you're jumping through space, you're teleporting, you're disappearing here and you're appearing someplace else. But if you're going to have a, a, a virtual reality that is consistent, that's not disappearing and a reappearing sort of thing, where things have to move continuously through space from pixel to pixel to pixel, then the fastest you can go is one pixel of space for every pixel of time. And we look at, um, you know, physics has kind of given us their best guess at what these pixels are, and they call it the Planck length and the Planck time. So Planck time's around 10 to the minus, you know, 44 seconds. Planck length, 10 to the uh, minus 36 meters, something like that. So these are very small, tiny little lengths, tiny little times. And that's where physics thinks that our reality goes granular. Well, that's what it does. It's granular, it's pixels, it's computed. So that's why she's a constant. It can't go any faster than that. That's as fast as anything can move pixel by pixel through our virtual reality. So all these other all these other uh, big ideas in science that, that, that are stuck in paradoxes, like uh, the Fermi paradox. Fermi paradoxes, where are they? He's talking about ETs or extraterrestrial people, you know, other people who surely there's other, you know, there's other people in this universe because there's trillions of trillions of suns and planets and there has to be something that kind of turned out just about like ours, wasn't too cold, wasn't too hot, you know, it had the right stuff to evolve Earth. It would be 
impossible to think that couldn't happen with all these trillions of trillions of suns. But Fermi said, well, our part of the universe is about a billion years younger than the old part of the universe. If it developed there like it developed here with us, then they should be where we are. They should have been where we are a billion years ago. And if that's the case, just looking at the normal way things populate and populations grow and you have to keep moving out the bigger and bigger living spaces, even at very low sublight speeds of going from planet to planet or moon to moon or whatever, they should have passed through here a long time ago. This place should, you know, every rock here should be up to capacity with people living on it because a billion years from now, you know, we're going to have go gotten a lot more out of our technology and a lot more. I mean, we already can go to the moon and can send probes to various places and land on, on moons of Jupiter and things like that. So surely in a billion years, we'll be able to, you know, colonize the moon and then other places as we are able. So he said, well, why isn't our universe then? Why isn't our Milky Way, our galaxy, why isn't that full? It should be. Plenty of time. Very conservative. Even if they were a lot dumber than us, grew up a lot slower than us, they should have been here, you know, a hundred million years ago. You know, so where are they? That's called the Fermi paradox. Well, there's no, there has been, it's a very strong paradox, logically. And there hasn't been any very strong answers to that paradox. But again, the virtual reality perspective puts a very strong answer to that paradox. And that is that this is a virtual reality. There isn't a lot of, perhaps there isn't a lot of waste in all those trillions of trillions of suns. If nobody's looking at them, they're not being computed. They're just potential things. All right, an astronomer gets a big telescope and he looks out there and he says, okay, I just counted them. There's a trillion trillion of them. Well, then the trillion trillion little dots of light have to be there. And then he turns off his telescope or he goes to lunch and they're not computed anymore. It's just like no man's sky. It's all computed on the fly. So it's possible that we're alone. It's just us, that the seven and a half billion of us here are it as far as in the space. And no, it's not a big waste because anything that we don't look at, that we don't measure is not being computed. So all those suns are not computed. They hardly ever have to be computed. At nighttime, those people who are still awake and looking up, well, okay, a bunch of little white dots have to be computed, but that's not much. You know, a computer can do that with hardly doing anything. And if you put a telescope out there, it only has to be computed while they're watching. And once somebody looks at it, then anybody looks back, they have to see the same thing again. It's the same story with virtual reality, and it has to be there. But none of that stuff really has to be computed. And then you ask the question, how many seats in this virtual reality entropy reduction trainer does the larger conscious system need? You know, does it need more than seven and a half billion seats? If it had seven and a half billion plus one more, is that one more going to help us collectively lower entropy any better or as much as it costs in overhead? Because now there's one more player that has to be given data stream, has to interact with all the other players. It, you know, there's a lot to keep up with there. So there's going to be a point where the addition of a new seat in the simulator costs more than it gives back. It's not going to increase the overall system's evolution much, but it's going to have a higher cost. So how many seats do they need? Do they need a billion planets like ours, all with seven and a half billion people on them? Does it need that many seats? Does it get value out of that many seats? It's really what I'm saying. And, you know, if you think about it from a systems viewpoint, it's like, yeah, probably not. You know, it's, uh, that's really not necessary. It's too many. So maybe seven and a half, and which will probably grow to eight, to nine, to 10, you know, who knows how far that'll go. Um, maybe that's all the seats it needs. It's got all the potential seats here that it can, that it can use. So indeed, we may not be alone. 
and there is no waste of all the rest of that universe. That whole universe is just potential, never computed unless somebody here looks at it. And we hardly ever look at it in detail. And when we do, you know, it's a very small number of people, a very small amount of time. So that's, see, so this idea, once you change your perspective, <laughs> to see this virtual reality perspective, all, all sorts of things start to change. And I've noticed that all of these paradoxes start to have logical explanations to them. You know, what's like, here's a big question from time immemorial. What's our purpose? Why are we here? What are we, what are we doing here? What should I be doing with my life? Well, it's to grow up. It's to, you know, increase the quality of your consciousness, lower your entropy, become love. That's why you're here. It's about other. You need to let go of your self-centeredness and you need to start becoming more empathetic and more caring. You need to ask, what can I give, not what can I get? And that's the whole point for us being here. That's the virtual reality. And it's an entropy reduction trainer for individuated units of consciousness. So then that answers that sort of thing. And if you look at, at even philosophical things, metaphysical things, and even theology, you'll find this viewpoint answers most of all those paradoxes, of all those big unknown questions, like, why am I here? It answers all that stuff. So now that does not make it right. So let me go on and say, this is a model. Okay, this is a theory of everything. It's just a model. And I do not want people to believe what I tell them, I want them to experience it. If it's not your experience, it's not your truth. And if it's not your truth, it's not going to help you grow up any. You can't grow up from reading a book or from listening to somebody talk to you. You have to grow up by changing who you are. You see, that's the, the, that's the point. So that's important. So don't believe anything I tell you. But if my model gives you something that you can hang your experience on, oh, yeah, I had experiences. You know, I had maybe an out-of-body or maybe I had a, a, a precognitive dream or I had these things, and I've never been able to explain it. If my model gives you something that you can hang your experience on, say, yeah, it explains this and this and this and it makes sense out of these things, then use it. But if it doesn't, throw it away. It's not useful for you. Do something else. So... I don't want this to be another belief system. We don't need any more belief systems. We have more belief systems than we can possibly use. Matter of fact, my, in my model, I say, believe nothing. Always be skeptical. Be skeptical of everything. But also, always be open-minded. Because if you're not open-minded, you'll shut yourself off from learning anything. If you're only skeptical and not open-minded, you'll never learn anything new. You're stuck in your own, in your own ignorance. But if you're only open-minded and not skeptical, you'll wander down la-la lane, you know, running into all kinds of belief traps that, uh, well, may or may not be of any value to you. So be skeptical of everything. And the person you have to be most skeptical of is yourself. And I certainly take that to heart. You know, I'm most skeptical of me. And that's why I tell people, don't believe what I say. Don't say, well, Tom Campbell said this, so it must be that way. Now, if Tom Campbell said something that then you can internalize and you can grow from and you can use, good. But otherwise, you got to get there on your own. you got to grow up on your own. You have to raise the quality of your consciousness by making good, low entropy choices. That means by making choices on the side of caring, compassion, love, helping. That's really what we're here for. And we, we individual units of consciousness, are one of the major strategies of the system to evolve itself. See, the system isn't done. It's still evolving. And we're a part of it. We're just pieces of it subsets of it, if you like. And as we grow up, as we learn, as we 
lower our entropy, the whole system's entropy is lowered because we're part of that system. So we're a, you know, we're a major strategy. We, we individual units of consciousness playing avatars here in this physical reality. We're a, a part of the system strategy for its own evolution. So it's not, don't think of it as just, you know, the system out there that's magic. It's not a supernatural system. It's a natural system. It's called consciousness. It's a information system. It can configurate piece, can, it can configurate parts of itself as a computer. That's the computer that serves up this virtual reality. Um, we're not the only virtual reality. There are other virtual realities. You are consciousness. You're not a body. You're consciousness. And as consciousness, you can travel around within consciousness and experience the things that consciousness can experience. Do the things that consciousness can do. You see? Now, one other thing I might say, because people will have issues. I'm trying to cover a lot of questions that people will have as I go. I'm sorry, Timo. I'm not, I'm not giving you opportunity to say anything. <laughs> Don't worry. I'm, I'm a good listener. <laughs> yeah, okay. Is that the, the relationship between the avatar and the, and the consciousness is that the avatar sets the constraints on what the consciousness can do with that avatar. So the consciousness can't say, avatar, flap your arms and fly away. Well, you know, we can flap our arms, but we're not going to fly anywhere because that, the rule set doesn't support that. Physics, we're too heavy. You know, we, we, we're just not made to fly by flapping our arms. So the rule set doesn't support it. So the avatar and the rule set that basically defines that avatar, remember the avatar evolved according to the rule set, that sets the constraints on what the consciousness can do. So it sets the context within which the consciousness make choices. So yes, if that avatar is in an accident and has a severe uh, concussion, then the consciousness working that avatar may be very limited for a while until he gets over that. So the consciousness is where all the memory is, but that consciousness may not be able to remember much of that life. It's constrained, in other words. Its access to memory is constrained because the avatar sets the constraints. Maybe I should say it another way. Uh, um, okay, let's say the person gets in that accident and afterwards, uh, the avatar cannot remember very much. He has amnesia and he slurs his words, can't speak very well, and he drags his left foot when he walks. That's the neurological damage he got in this accident. Well, now that consciousness is not hurt. The consciousness is fine. Consciousness is just an individual unit of consciousness, but now he's playing an avatar that can't remember things, that can't speak well, and only walks by dragging his left foot. That's the constraints on the avatar he's playing. So he can't say, well, avatar, uh, you know, go to work. Let's go out for a run. Um, you know, let's have a conversation with somebody. You can't do that because the avatar is incapable. He can't speak well. He can't walk well. He doesn't think well, so the consciousness now has to start working with that avatar the way it is. Help, you know, working with that avatar with the constraints that are there. Now you have biology, which has rules that allow that avatar to heal and maybe get over that stuff and, and change. So that's, that's how that works. So the, there is an avatar to consciousness link where the things that change in the avatar, they don't change consciousness, but they limit consciousness as far as what consciousness can do with that, with that avatar. So that's, that's how that works. So when somebody is, uh, has Alzheimer's, their consciousness isn't really forgetful and doesn't know who anybody is. It's that their consciousness has to play an avatar. They can't remember who their family members are. You see, so they just play a, uh, an avatar of lesser capacity, lesser ability, because avatars have all sorts of ranges of abilities, and they just play one of lesser ability at that point. So the, the, the consciousness doesn't have some sort of uh, disease, just the avatar, but the consciousness is limited. So the consciousness itself may be able to 
offline remember all sorts of things and still have access to all of that information, but that he can't process that through the avatar. The avatar won't speak, won't walk, you know, doesn't remember. So it's not that it really limits the consciousness in the sense of the consciousness in itself, but it limits what the consciousness can do. In other words, you're playing your elf and your elf gets hurt. So you're, you know, you're, a, you're in World of Warcraft and you got this elf and he fell off a cliff and he fell onto the rocks and now he's hurt. Well, if he was hurt in that game, that means he loses hit points. He's not so vigorous anymore. You know, his, his, uh, he, he's not very good at fights anymore. He doesn't walk very fast anymore. So he has low health points. So you have to play a character now that is, that is crippled. But eventually, of course, in, the, in that game, the player will get healthy again, get his hit points back, It'll, he'll, you know, he'll do better. But for a while, you can't fight well, you can't run well, there's all kinds of things you can't do. So you, as the player, it doesn't make you hurt, you're not hurt, you're still sitting there the same, but you just can't get your player to do anything more than hobble around and in a fight, he just falls over because he doesn't have any hit points and doesn't have any health points. You see? So it's the same way, trying to differentiate this consciousness avatar role. So that's generally my idea. Now, one other thing I'd like to say, this is a long introduction, isn't it? One of the other things I'd like to say is that I have come up with some physics problems, some quantum mechanics problems that directly conflict with current wisdom in quantum mechanics. Current wisdom in quantum mechanics says that this quantum mechanics problem, if performed, you know, the experiment, if performed, would do this, and I say, no, it won't, it'll do that. And it's based on what I've just said, my, my, my interpretation of quantum mechanics or virtual reality interpretation of quantum mechanics. Now I have those experiments being done in Southern California at uh, Cal Poly, that's California Polytech in Pomona. They've been working on it now for some months. It's going very slowly, excruciatingly, maddeningly slowly, but these things just take time. Quantum mechanics experiments are just not real easy to do. They take a lot of time and effort, and these folks are chugging their way through it, getting there, getting closer, you know, every week. But it's going to be months and months yet before we actually get there. So that's coming up. So this theory is indeed falsifiable. You can indeed predict things. And here's one of them. So we'll just see how that works out, whether my interpretation of quantum physics uh, uh, will prevail and the standard model theory will fail or vice versa. I don't know. I think my mind has a really good chance of working. But, you know, I don't assume that I'm perfect and that I know everything. You know, I could be wrong. You know, there's some assumptions in mine. You know, I have to assume what, how the larger conscious system would handle such and such a problem. What would it do? Where's, where's the logic it would follow? Often, there's more than one path that the system could take. It could do A, B, C, or D, and all of those would work for it but it usually chooses the one that is the most efficient as far as computer science goes. It's the most efficient process to render. So it tends to do that, which would make sense. If you're rendering this big thing, you want to render it efficiently. So I've kind of made some assumptions of what I think is the most efficient process that the system, how it would render it. And I could be wrong, but we'll see. If I am, then I'll change the theory. That's what theories are supposed to do. They're not supposed to be laws. They're supposed to be, here's the way I see it now. And I really would like it if you found holes in it, things that it didn't fit, things that it didn't say, because that means the theory is incomplete. And if it's incomplete, you can either fix it, expand it, or if you need to, throw it out, start over. And I'm not opposed to any of those things. I'm a scientist and I'd like to find what's true from what's not true. And that's basically where I am and that's what I present. I'm not presenting another thing to believe in. Goodness sakes, don't do that. I'm presenting another way of looking at the world that may just answer a whole lot of your 
big questions of how do things work and why do they work that way. You know, so this explains all the paranormal things, makes them all perfectly normal, and explains why do they work sometimes and sometimes they don't. Why sometimes does it, does it just happen? And other times, even when you're trying very hard, you can't make it happen. You know, why is it like that? Why are remote viewers only about 85, 90% accurate? Why they mess up sometimes, they get the wrong picture. Why does that happen? Why are some people better at it than others? Why does it work real well one day and doesn't work at all the next? Well, once you understand how they really work, you realize, yeah, that's, that's the way it is. All of those things are, <clears throat> are part of how it works. So that's now a summary of Tom Campbell and his model and kind of what it is, where it's going, what it's done. I know you do like to do science and spirituality and see how they meet. So I tried to kind of give it that spin. So what I've done is come up with a, a scientific model, a logical model. It's all deductive logic. Start with an assumption. The assumptions are consciousness exists and evolution exists. Well, That's it. That's it. And you, you go from there logically and you can end up in all of these places, not with any additional assumptions, just by logically saying, well, what makes, you know, what does the logic say? What are the possibilities? I have to say that that was a nice short introduction. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, I have a hard time doing anything short. It, uh, when you have a, a theory of everything, it's a really big subject. It's very oh, broad. It's That's very cool. deep. Mm -hmm. And if you just give a little sound bites of it, it sounds like you're a madman making stuff up. You really have to get into it and see the whole theory to see that it is a logical, a logical science. You also already answered uh, some of those uh, questions that I had. I had uh, these questions that you are, if you could uh, share those basic ideas of MPT, but you already did. You pick it up. <laughs> yeah. Consciousness. And uh, oh, you also explained those terminology, what is, uh, uh, what, what is consist of uh, your theory and so on. So you already answered that, or did you, is there something what you didn't say? Actually? Well, you know, we can make some definitions like, um, you know, I say you need to get rid of ego and what is ego? Ego is, ego is uh, awareness in a service of fear. Mm. That's ego. Uh, awareness, that's consciousness, you know, consciousness is aware, awareness in the service of fear. Uh, as it turns out, that's not such a special definition after all. That's very much the same thing Freud found. It's awareness in the service of fear. Freud found the ego to be something that was need, needed. Everybody needs a healthy ego to get by. You know, it's part of our definition in ourself. And that's because Freud was an experimentalist. He looked at people. And he saw that everybody had this ego and that they seemed to be getting by pretty well. They were healthy, happy people, you know, had children that behaved themselves and nice jobs and dressed well and didn't smell bad. And you know, so he said, well, this must be a good thing that everybody needs. But what actually what is that everybody pretty much is full of fear. Almost everybody's up to their eyebrows in fear. And that ego is a product of fear. So you have awareness in the service of fear. So what kinds of fear? You know, fear of being not good enough, fear of being inadequate, fear of not being lovable, fear of being overlooked, fear of not uh, being appreciated, uh, fear of just, we have, we have all sorts of fears, we humans. And, you know, they're not, you know, fear of death, you know, you could throw that in there too, you know, fear, fear of death, fear of being wrong. Uh, lots of the, lots of fears, and mostly the choices that we make are are what can I say are actualized by those fears. It's the fear that has a large component of how it is we make that choice. Okay, we have we have um, you know in our in our mind in our consciousness we have intentions for choices. 
I have an intention and I make a choice that follows that intention. And most of those intentions are fear-based. That's just the way human is at this point. This, this uh, learning lab for, uh, uh, you know, for individuated units of consciousness is more like an elementary school than it is like a college or a graduate school. Most of us have a lot of fear and we, we have had, but we as a species are growing up, you know, humanity as it was in, you know, what, 500, 800, thousand years ago is very different than humanity today. So we are evolving. We are evolving, but we still have a long way to go. So ego is not just a sense of self. It's a sense of self is a fine thing. Nothing wrong with that. You can have awareness in the service of love, and Freud called that superego, basically. Awareness that wasn't about self, but about other. You know, and uh, that's, of course, where we want to live. <laughs> we want to live in you know, superego, not as, not as ego. We want to be awareness and service of others. So that's where we're headed. So that would be one thing. Another thing would be to look at the philosophy um, and the opposite, the opposite corners of, of um, this model. And by that I mean we have, I come in with, a, with an assumption that consciousness exists. When I have that assumption, uh, several other assumptions come with that. They're just part of it. Also, free will exists and time exists. You cannot have consciousness without having choice. I mean, you know, that's what consciousness does. It makes choices. It's, a, it's an information system. It chooses what information to get or what to do with its information. It makes choices. So a consciousness that doesn't make any choices is just not consciousness. It's just nothing. It doesn't function. You know, it's non-functional. So um, consciousness makes choices. And if you have choices, then you have before you made the choice and after you made the choice because the choice makes a difference. So it's a real choice, not an imaginary choice. So you have to have time. And you also have to have free will, because if there's no free will, then there really was no choice. You're not making a choice. If there's no free will, there is no choice. Everything is just scripted, everything, you know, like a movie. You know, you can rewind a movie and play it again, but all the characters will say exactly the same thing that they said the first time you ran the movie. You know, they don't have any free will as characters there in the movie. They just say their lines exactly the same way every time because that's what would capture a film. Well, that's what, that's what it means to have no free will. Nothing ever changes. So you cannot grow, you cannot learn, you cannot have choices, and you cannot have consciousness. So consciousness, free will, okay, and, and um, time all logically necessary for each other to exist. So they all exist together in, in one kind of logical lump. Now, the opposite of that is determinism and materialism. If you are a materialist, you must also be a determinist because materialism requires determinism. So if you're a determinist, you have to say that free will, consciousness, and time are all illusions. And if you think that conscious free will and time are real things, then you have to say that, that uh, determinism and materialism are illusions. You see, those two opposite philosophical corners are uh, just completely incompatible with each other. If you're a determinist, because you're a scientist and scientists have learned that they need to be determinists, but you also think there's free will and consciousness, well, you're just logically inconsistent and don't know it. So there are a lot of people that play, you know, mix and match in that bunch, but it's just logical inconsistency when they do so. Those two sides are completely opposite. So indeed we do have science that tells us physics will tell you that time doesn't exist, consciousness doesn't exist, 
and that free will doesn't exist. That's the point of science because they need to be deterministic and they need to be materialistic because that is their basic core belief in science. But it's like that. We got that ever since Newton. Newton, clockwork universe, you know, that was deterministic. And that's why quantum mechanics is just called weird science because it couldn't possibly be real science or logical science because it's not deterministic, it's probabilistic. It doesn't fit. So rather than saying, well, we have quantum mechanics and it just is a fact that double slit, you know, happens the same way every time you do it. So therefore materialism and determinism must not be true because here we have an experiment that say they're not true. Well, scientists started that way, but they couldn't come up with any alternative. They couldn't come up with any al alternate explanation for it. So instead, after a while, they gave up beating their head against that wall and said, well, actually we do have determinism and, and uh, materialism and quantum physics is just weird and nobody will ever understand it. Nobody will never understand, you know, will ever understand it. And it's just one of those things that is meant to always be a secret to us. So that was their thing, you know, say, oh, well, yeah, too, there is materialism and there is this determinism. The quantum mechanics just is odd. It doesn't fit into that. It's something else. Well, that's a pretty weak, that's pretty weak as far as science goes, you know, to have that. So I just thought I'd kind of point out that, that idea. So now from my viewpoint, I'd say materialism and determinism are uh, illusionary. It just looks like this is a material world. Well, just like in a, when you're in a simulation, particularly if you're in one of those really high price ones where you're in a, on a platform that moves and you, know, you have the big, the big headset on that, that cause, you know, when you're in one of those really high price simulations, it's just like being there. I mean, it's very, very real. So to them, then my viewpoint is that being in a material reality is just an illusion looks like a material reality. If you were that elf that you're playing in World of Warcraft and that elf you know, could become conscious and look around, he would think that he was a real thing. He would think that you know, he was conscious. He would think he was making all those choices. But that really wouldn't be true. So that's like us with our avatar. So I'd say that those, those physicists are having an illusion <laughs> of materialism and an illusion of determinism and that uh, really this is a virtual reality and it's a probabilistic it's 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 uh, the way it's rendered is probably with, with probability not with determinism but with probability yes. and free will is never abrogated you always have free will which maybe is one other thing i should say and that is that Free will doesn't mean that you get everything you want. Free will is not having a genie with unlimited wishes. Free will is that among the things that you are aware of, among the choices that you're aware of, you can choose. So if there are five things that I'm aware of that I could do, and I choose one, I have the free will to make that choice. That's all free will is. So if you happen to be a prisoner and you're in jail for some terrible crime, and you'd really like to go home with, to your family for Christmas, well, you do not have the ability to make that choice. That's not one of the choices that's in your group of things that you can choose to do. So that doesn't mean you don't have free will. You still have things that are in your choice that you can do, and your free will then is, is choosing those choices. And yes, there's lots of people trying to manipulate us and just because people are trying to manipulate us doesn't mean we don't have free will. There are marketers and other people make us think we need faster cars and bigger houses. There are people that make us think all sorts of things. We're manipulated all the time by politicians, by you know, preachers and priests, by you know, whatever. We're manipulated all the time by all sorts of things, by marketers certainly. But that doesn't mean we don't have free will. We still get to make the choice. We still can make those choices. And we let somebody talk us into you know, doing something, then that's a choice we make. 
So if somebody says, yeah, what you need to do is go buy a faster car. And we say, wow, I want to buy a faster car because I read something about it and it sounded really cool. Well, that's still your choice. You don't have to do that. So just because you make poor choices or even because you're being manipulated doesn't mean that you don't have free will. You do have free will. And it's a cop out to say, oh yeah, I made all kinds of terrible choices, but it's not me. It's just this environment I live in, you know. It's, it's, it's my culture. Everybody eats junk food. So of course I eat junk food too. I can't help it. Well, that's a cop out. You can't do help it. So one of the fundamental things in this reality is that you have to take responsibility for all your choices. If you do things that you think are non-productive, that's your choice. If you get angry and you get upset and you're depressed and you're unhappy and you know, you're annoyed and you don't like the way the world is and so on, if that upsets you and you feel negative about it, that's your choice. You don't have to feel those things about it. You can live in a pretty nasty world and still be positive. Matter of fact, if you're not still positive, you're part of the problem, not part of the solution. You have to be positive to be part of the solution. So people who look at the nasty world we live in and they start getting cranky and they, they're upset about it and they're angry, they become part of the problem. They see themselves as part of the solution, but just by their anger, they become part of the problem. You have to be positive. You have to be caring. That doesn't mean that you say, oh, I don't care. Yeah, okay, we live in a horrible place and people are <laughs> looting and killing and, you know, and that's all right with me. No, it's not necessarily all right with you, but you don't let it make you depressed. You don't go out and get your gun and say, well, I'm going to go show those guys and go out and uh, so that's becoming part of the problem. You have to work at the problem in a positive way. No, my philosophy is not a pacifist philosophy. There's time to fight back, but you have to do that such that fighting is the low entropy solution. And that doesn't occur often. <laughs> fighting is almost always the high entropy solution, but not always. There's sometimes it's when it's, it's time to fight back. But there's certain ways of fighting back that are lower entropy ways and higher entropy ways. So you need to, you need to push back in a way that makes you part of the solution, not in a way that just makes the problem worse. And that's... These are uh, important words. These pardon? Are important, these are very important words, what you just said. We have to choose how we react. We can choose. But, yeah. Uh, 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 if we going back a little bit about the basic ideas of MPP, what kind of role has uh, intuition in your theories? What role does tradition have? Intuition. Intuition? Yes. Has a very large role. Intuition, well, let me tell it this way. The mind, the consciousness, works with two in two ways, okay, two, two sources of experience, let's say, and, and ways of it interacts. One, on this side's intellect, and on this side's the intuition. It functions two ways, okay? It gathers, accesses, it gathers information, assesses information, uses information, and it has these two paths. Now, these two paths, just together, both together, they work wonderfully. Because one has strong points in exactly the place the other has weak points. So you really need both of these. But what we do is that we take this intellectual part and starting at five or six years old, we start polishing that and training that and developing that. And we develop that intellect, and develop that intellect because that will give us a better paying job. That'll, you know, that'll uh, give us a, you know, a, uh, uh, what a, we think a, a better life and more interesting life. You know, we, we really want that, that intellect's kind of key to success in our culture. And we don't develop that intuitive side very much. We just kind of let it be. So before we're five or six years old, seven years old, really kind of the break point there, we're mostly intuitive. We're very intuitive beings up to that point. But then somewhere that 
that intellect just kind of runs right over us. And pretty soon we're, we're dominantly intellectual. Now let's look at those two things. We have an intellect and the intellect has this very precise tool called logic. It's a very precise tool. And if you get good at logic and being logical, boy, that intellect can do some marvelous things. Okay. That is its strong point. So it's tool, the way it does its processing, the way it figures things out, this logic, very precise, very accurate tool. The problem with this intellect is it never has very much information. In order to solve a deductive logic problem, you need to know a whole lot of things. You need to know what all the, you know, the previous steps were, what all the background is. You need to understand lots of things before you can say, and therefore, you know, predict the next step. Therefore, people very seldom are actually very logical. We think we're logical, but we're not very logical because we almost never have the information we need to be logical. Now, the, the times we are logical are usually the times that we're making rather insignificant or easy choices. Eh. But I'm talking about the big choices. Should I marry Susie or should I marry Sally? No, those are big choices. When I make those two, that choice, it's going to change my life, Susie's life, Sally's life, and you know, a lot of other things will change at that point for making that choice. Now, I call that a big choice. It's a life changer. All right, now, where's the logic? How can I apply logic to that problem? <laughs> of course, I can't. I don't have enough information. If I had a crystal ball looked into the future, maybe I could make a better assessment, but I don't. So I have to use this precise, wonderful tool, but I have very ratty, uh, insufficient, inadequate information to feed into that tool. And most of all the big decisions, how do you raise your children? Oh yeah, let's solve that problem with logic. <laughs> it's not gonna work. You don't have the information you need and you have more information there. Yeah, you can read all the books about raising children, but your children are unique. They're your children and you are unique. You're you, and that lowers the, you know, the possibilities down to, to something else, and it's not logical. We have emotions. Those emotions are not lo logical. We have fears. They're not logical. And I mentioned that most of our choices are driven by, you know, by fear. Well, most of our choices are illogical then. They're driven by fear because fear is illogical. So, in any case... We have a, a precise, consistent tool with a very ratty, imprecise, inadequate information feeding it. But we do the best we can. We, do, we make a lot of guesses. Well, I guess Sally would be the one. You know, you, you just, you have hunches and so on. Now we have the intuitive side on this other side over here is the intuition. And it has just the opposite. It has access to all the information, precise information, reliable information. And you're, if you don't understand that, you're saying, what, where's all that information coming from? It has access to what I call the databases, which are uh, things that are re required for the rendering of the simulation. And if I could tell you about how the simulation's rendered and you'd see how these databases just come up as a natural requirement of the rendering process. Now, the uh, Hindus call those the Akashic Records, but it's the same thing. These databases exist. You can look at probable futures. You can't look at the future because this is not determinism, remember, but you can look at probable futures. You can look at past. You can look at somebody and see how they're feeling, what their emotional state is, uh, what health they are, all kinds of things. And you can find that out about yourself. So you've got all of this information. So if somebody comes up and starts an argument, you've got enough information there to know why. What really is their problem? What's the issue? What's the real issue? Rather than, 
well, you're just going to have to let them holler at you. And you have no idea why they're, you know, why they feel that way. You got all this information, but the tool that you have to use to access that information is called your intuition and your intuition is a little ratty. It's a little uncertain. And the le reason it's a little ratty and uncertain is because there's so many variables that feed it. It's one of these things that it has to do with you. It has to do with how you feel. It has to do with how steady your consciousness is. It has to do with your thoughts. Are your thoughts constantly zinging around in your head or can you focus down to a particular thing? It depends on the clearness of your intention. It depends on how much you care, how, how much buy-in you have in a situation or whether you're just frivolous. Oh, I want to know this and I want to know that. It depends on why you want to know, see, what you're going to do with that information. It depends on all those things. So unless you come at it from exactly the right way, with the right attitude, the right skills, the right practice, without expectation, without belief, without fear, if you get rid of all that stuff, all right, now your intuition is good. You've developed that intuition. And that intuition can be developed to be just as steady and solid and accurate and reliable as over on the other side, as your, as your logic. But almost none of us ever develop it that much because it's just the intuition. And the scientists will tell you, you don't even have an intuition. <laughs> That's just nonsense. That's something you imagine that you have an intuition. So any case, so we have these two things. Now you can develop it, but that developing it means that you, you can work real hard at it. Like you can learn to remote view and you can take classes where they teach you remote view and people will give you processes to learn to do that. And what they're trying to get you to do is to harness your intuition for this one particular process, remote viewing, this one particular goal is to remote view. And what you'll find is that sometimes, wow, you amaze yourself. You're really good at it. And other times, <laughs> you're terrible. You can't get it right to save yourself. And that's because you, as consciousness, are all over the place. Yes, you can put those fears and get rid of them by deep breathing and doing this and that and saying things and going through these processes, but it doesn't last very long. And these little thoughts fly through your mind all the time. And, and there you are in this nice theta state, all you're, you're good at this. And suddenly, bingo, this comes in. Oh, what did she mean by that? And other thoughts come in and it just destroys what you're doing. So you're totally out of control as far as your, your intuition goes. Your intuition's flopping all over the place. You're getting in its way. Okay. That intuition has to work without the intellect telling it what to do, without the intellect judging it. Most people can't get by that problem because they live out of their intellects. And as soon as their intuition comes up with something, the intellect says, oh, where'd that come from? Did you just make that up? That's a bunch of nonsense. How can you prove that? Show me, you know, show me the proof for that. That's just stuff you're making up because you're either afraid of it or that's what you want to hear. You see, the intellect jumps right in and questions and reassesses and tries to make a logic problem out of it. It's not a logic problem. You can make a logic problem out of the intuition. The intuition just is. That information is just there. You see, so if you've got both working, then you have this intuition that has all the wonderful data that's very precise and exact. And that logic is a wonderful tool for working with that data. And both together, you've really got something here that can that can be very, very helpful. But either one by itself doesn't work very well. If you live out of your head, then you don't have much of an intuition. Or if you do have gut feelings and they're just gut feelings and they don't work as often as they do, and you wouldn't really trust one. You're not, you're not going to bet the farm based on your gut feeling because sometimes they're just wrong because your ego your fear, all kinds of other things. You in there and mess with those gut feelings all the time. You're too unreliable to, you know, for, to depend on them. So you live out of your head. You don't have that. 
So you're guessing all the time. You're, you're doing your best guess and uh, trying to be clever, but you're wrong probably more often than you're right. That's just life like that because you just don't have enough information. You just can't be a good guesser when you only have you know 10% of the information. Now, if you only are, are on the intuitive side and you don't have your, your logic going, you don't have your intellect going, then you see all kinds of things. You know all kinds of things, but you don't know how you know them. You know that you just know them. You know that certain things are going to happen and that certain people are going to get sick and that other sick people are going to get well. And you know this is happening there, even though you're not there, but you just know that's what's going on at home. You're very intuitive and you don't have a very good job because everybody calls you an airhead because you don't seem to really be plugged into the you know, to what's going on. You're, you're, you know, you're looked at as being a little flaky and a little weird because though people know you come up with some amazing things a lot of times, there's never, sometimes you don't. Sometimes the things you come up with aren't so good too every once in a while. And since you can't explain any of it to anybody, you couldn't teach anybody else how to do it. It's just the way you are. And now you're a right brain person. Maybe you can make a living reading palms or you know, reading auras or doing something like that because you're very, very right brained. You learn to do things that way. You're medical intuitive and maybe you can work that in. So being just all one or all the other is not really functional. You need to have both. You need to be extremely right brained, extremely intuitive and extremely left brain, which is extremely logical process. You need both of those and let those two just work together seamlessly as they do. And it, once you have that and get that intellect to stop being in control, then the intellect will play nice with that intuition and it needs some information. It says, Hey, you know, intuition, give me some information. And the intu intuition will say, yeah, okay, here's a bunch of information. Go figure out what it means. You know, and they work together with each other. And boy, you got something that, that's great. But if you're used to being all intellect, then as soon as that information, information comes from your intuition, you discount it, you throw it away, you, you question it, you demand evidence, you demand process of where does it come from, and none of that's available. It just is. Intuitive things don't come with a process. They're not logical, they're beyond logic. It's just accessing data. Now, the neat thing is that because fear is the enemy, fear is the thing we're trying to get rid of. Fear is the primary thing that keeps you from developing your intuition. It's what keeps your intuition being squirrely. Your intuition still getting run over by fears and wants and needs and desires and ego and relationship and you want to be cool. You really want to get the right answer because then everybody would really look up to you and, and think you had value if you could get the right answer. So you start focusing on need. You have this need to get the right answer. Well, if your need to get the right answer is big enough, it will ensure absolutely that you will not get the right answer because a need to get the right answer is what will make it impossible to get the right answer. You see, that's not the way the intuition works. You don't drive the intuition. You don't force it. It just has to happen. So you can develop your intuition by getting rid of your fear. Well, that's how you grow up and become love is by getting rid of your fear. And the more you grow up and become love, the easier and easier it is to access stuff with that intuition. Yeah. So once you get to the point that you have very little fear, you have very little ego, very, very few beliefs, accessing the, the intuitive information, eh, piece of cake. You don't need a training course. <laughs> You just well, kind of open your hand and it falls into it. It's just there when you need it. You don't really have to do anything. It's just there. You just pluck it out of the air when you need it. So I teach people, I have courses where I teach people how to do all the paranormal stuff, how to remote view, I got a body, uh, telepathic communications, healing, you know, all the things. And the reason I do that is because 
if they ever get actually good at it, the only way they can get good at it is by getting rid of their fear, growing up, caring about other people, becoming love. Now, you can get good at one maybe aspect of it, one little narrow aspect of it for a while, just by working very, very hard, but it doesn't last all that long, and it's usually uh, limited. Just limited to a very small patch of what's available. So you can kind of force your way into small pieces of it, but that's not the same as having all of it at your fingertips. It's a really big difference. So what it does is I tell people that they need to grow up. This, this won't work if you're not caring. This won't work if it's about yourself and feeding your ego. Or it won't work well. It'll work very badly. It'll be very inconsistent. Not The consistency will be as such that you can never depend on it. So in a way, it's a way of teaching people to grow up. Because as they try to practice these things, they have to practice letting go of their ego. So I noticed that, uh, that as they work at the paranormal things, some interesting things happen. As they get better and better at the paranormal things, they get less and less interested in actually ever doing anything paranormal. <laughs> Those two things work in opposite directions. And the people that get really good at it, and you say that they would, you know, they uh, are very powerful, they hardly ever use it. They only use it occasionally when they see how they could help somebody with it, that it's a helpful thing for somebody else. And then they'll pull out those skills and do them. But otherwise, they don't use it. And that's because they've grown up enough to know that the reason we're here is to deal with what happens. I mean, that's the point of this virtual reality. Stuff happens and we get to deal with it. And how we deal with it is how we grow up. If we deal with it with low entropy choices, we get to evolve. Otherwise, we de-evolve. So that's the name of the game. And if you were using your, your paranormal abilities to modify future probability and only make the, thing, you know, make the things that you want to happen, higher probability to happen, things you don't want, lower probability, you, know, you don't want it to rain because you have a picnic next Saturday, so you use your intent to make it less probable that you're going to get rain. And you start living your life in this bubble of your own creation, all you're doing is taking yourself out of the flow that'll actually help you grow up. You become isolated in a bubble. And then what happens after you're isolated in this bubble is your ego starts to grow and you start feeling pretty powerful and pretty full of yourself that, yeah, my life is kind of charmed because I make it that way because I can manipulate all this stuff. And then before you know it, that big ego trashes you. You, you crash and burn, things don't work out, you know, life becomes awful. So that's, you know, it doesn't work. You don't use the paranormal things to make your life better. You use the paranormal things to be of service. That's about the only way you use them. And mostly you don't use them at all because you know the way things are, it's just the way they need to be for everybody to have the maximum chance and an opportunity to grow up because most people's problems are self-created. If you're not happy, if you don't look at life and say, wow, life is fun. Life really is fun. It's enjoyable. I have joy. I have satisfaction in life. It's good. If that's the way you feel, then you probably don't have a lot of fear or a lot of ego or a lot of beliefs. If you feel like geez, life is a struggle, it's always a struggle. As soon as I think I've got it over this next hurdle, and I get past it, something else comes up, then something else comes up. And now I've got this before I had that, you know, and it's just on and on and on. It's like, there's this never ending struggle of things that are the something negative is always looming on the horizon and always threatening. And your life has a lot of pain in it. You're unhappy. You don't feel satisfied. You don't feel much joy. That's because you have a lot of fear, you have a lot of ego, and you have a lot of beliefs. So, and that's just the way, so which way would you like your life to be? You know, it's a pretty obvious choice, isn't it? It's, uh, but that's the way it is. So you either grow up or you have to struggle. Indeed. Uh, uh, if we're talking about uh, intuitions on, 
I remember that it was all the Nobel Prize winner Barbara McClintock who uh, said uh, in 1980s that you have to put yourself aside that your intuition can work. Yes, that's what he meant is you have to put your intellect aside. But we see ourselves as our intellect. That's how we see ourselves. Yes. And, and that's what he meant. But you have to put that intellect aside so you stop thinking and start being. It's in a being space. And one of the words I use is, is that you have, you know, there's the intellectual level and there's the being level. And you have to learn to live at the being level. Mm. So the being level, the intuitive level, that's where you want to live. But you've also got this intellect that can process and compute and analyze. That's a tool you use. But where you really want to live is at the being level where you just are. You're not an image. You are authentic who you are. You are, you know, you've completely accepted responsibility for all your choices. You're not angry. You don't get angry because that's, you just don't choose to be angry because you realize that that's a choice that always makes everything worse. It's never helpful. So you choose not to be angry. So you're not angry. And people will say, well, I, I get angry, but I can't choose not to be angry. I'm just angry when I'm angry. Well, you can choose to change yourself such that you don't get angry. You may not be able to make that choice yet. That's one of those choices. It's not in your ability to choose. Remember, free will. You can just choose among the things, not among everything that's possible, but just the things that are within your reach. And one of those things could be, I want to learn to get rid of my anger. Therefore, I've got to learn that that anger is a part of fear. It's a fear that I'm not being treated well, or, or I'm not being, being appreciated, or I'm, I'm inadequate. And people think I'm not doing things right, and I, I, I feel inadequate. So when anybody reminds me that I haven't done something right, I get angry because that's my response. That's my defense. So you'll learn that that anger just comes from your fear and you need to get rid of that fear or you'll always be angry. So then you start working on the fear and finding the fear and finding that ego and then the anger has gone. And then anybody can say anything, any way, any time. And it doesn't make you angry because you just don't have that fear anymore of being inadequate. So that's, that's, you know, the way it has to be, right? You have to step away, step out of yourself, take yeah. that intellectual part and set it aside, deal intuitively and be open. And in order to do that, your mind cannot be full of chatter and it can't be, you know, you can't be imposing beliefs or any kind of expectations or any kind of needs. If you do that, that doesn't work out either. You have to just be open and you get what you get. And that's, that's good. And you'll get exactly what you need. And then it may not be what you want, but it'll be what you need. Then there is one other thing uh, what I, I would like to hear you from your uh, MPT theories that uh, uh, we are also having, uh, uh, if we're talking about uh, that these are like uh, tools of consciousness, like uh, thoughts and emotions and intuition, but then there is also sensitivity. It's also tools tool of uh, consciousness. What do you think about that? What is the role of being sensitivity? Is it like a making observations? Um, well, sensitivity is basically awareness, mm. right? It's just awareness. I mean, awareness is consciousness. Consciousness is aware. So the, the, more, you, the more you grow up, the more aware you are, the bigger your decision space gets. That, that, that little set of the choices you had, that's what I call your decision space. That's all the choices that you have right now is your decision space. As you grow up and lower your entropy, your decision space gets bigger and bigger and bigger. The reality that you live in gets bigger and bigger. The information you have at your fingertips gets greater and greater. You're a lot more sensitive to things because you understand things a lot better. When somebody comes in and you see, and they're angry, instead of you going, uh-oh, you know, what's wrong, what's wrong here? You immediately can, can have a connection with that person. You can feel that anger. You can feel how they feel. If you like, you can calm them down some. You can give them some calming stuff to just relax. It'll be okay. 
and you can also get some idea of, of what's happened. So you, you see things from a, so much bigger picture that you are more sensitive to everything yes. because you understand everything. You know, it, it, um, it's just awareness and your awareness grows as you grow. So if you care about people, then you get sensitive to things that have to do with caring about people. Now, some people, let's, let's look at the opposite side of that. Some people are very empathic and some people are so empathic that they want to be able to turn it off and can't. And they will say, oh, you know, I feel everybody's feelings. I feel everybody's emotions. And when people are upset or something, I just feel all that. And it's disorienting. And I can't turn it off. I can't walk into a big store, you know, a big department store, because there's so many people. It's just, uh, I feel all of them and all of their energy. And it's just overwhelming. And they have a problem with, they're too sensitive. Well, not really the case. They... They have created that problem themselves because of attitudes that they have, but they can be taught to turn it off. That, that link that they have is just like any other digital link, like a, a website. You know, you can, you can tune up, a, you can put, type in a URL and up pops a website. And if you don't like that website, you click the little X in the upper right hand corner and it disappears. You can turn it on or turn it off. You can get the information that flows through that site or you can eliminate it. Well, you can do the same thing with your consciousness. You're in charge. You can open up ports. You can close ports. You can open up to certain kinds of feelings, close down to others. You can open up to the, to the energy of the room and everybody that's in it. So you can feel everybody that's in a department store, even on all the different floors, you know. You can even feel all the energy of all the people that have been in that department store all day long. If you want to, it's just an intention. So you can open it as big as you want, or you can close it down to as small as you want. You can turn it off to where you don't feel anybody in that store. You're the only one there as far as you're feeling. All of this is available to you. But people who are empathetic generally are that way because they care about others. They have this, you know, they, they, other people's feelings, they open themselves to other people's feelings because they care about other people. And it's that caring about other people which is what develops their empathy. So that developing, that, that, enter, that, uh, uh, that ability to empathize develops as their caring develops. Okay, they, they, uh, they like having that information. It mm -hmm. gives them a leg up sometimes. It gives them an inside, you know, inside information that others don't have. Makes them popular. Makes everybody want to come tell them their problems because they're sympathetic. They don't want to shut it off because they have this idea that's wrong, that you have to shut either all off or all on. Mm. They don't want to shut it all off. Partly because they care. Mm. and they like being connected with people. But now they're in a room with 50 people, and they're getting more than they want. But they fear <clears throat> that if they try to squish it, they'll lose it. So that's the problem they have. They don't want to be overwhelmed, but they don't want to lose the ability. And generally, I tell them and sometimes teach them that, no, you can, you can turn it up, turn it down to suit yourself cut off pieces of it and leave the other pieces open. And that's like a whole new idea to them. And once they learn that they can do that, then problem solved. They don't have it, the problem anymore, but they've, they, they hold on to this, to this ability to be empathic. Like they'd hold on to like a six year old holds on to a favorite teddy bear. That's part of what defines them as who they are. And they don't want <coughs> to let that go, but they can control it. So that's, <laughs> kind of a sen being too sensitive is a problem for some people, but that's yeah. mostly just they're not aware <clears throat> of how to regulate that. But sensitivity grows as you grow. As a matter of fact, as you grow up, and that grown up person I was describing, that grown up person doesn't live in the same reality you live in. They live in one that's much richer. 
has much more information in it, has much more, a much bigger decision space. So that person lives really in more than just the physical reality, because that intuitive space is not in the physical reality. And if you live in your intuitive space, but are perfectly uh, able to function very well with your intellectual space, you tend to live in that intuitive space, function intellectually as you need to, rather than the other way around. The intuitive space really is home more than the intellectual space. You can always be intellectual when you need to. Easy to bring that tool up whenever you need it. The real you lives in that intuitive space. Well, thanks for this answer. Um, do you still have a time to carry on or do you need to break or should we end? No, I can carry on some. Let's go ahead. Now that I've got that lozenger working, I'll probably be all right for a while. Mm. We have been uh, talking about uh, pretty much about the next question what I had uh, that uh, I would like to hear your thoughts about evolution of the consciousness. Uh, are we evolving as a consciousness to perceive new dimensions and levels of being as a co consciousness expands? And are we at the same developing our inner ability for uh, perception? It's say, that last part, say that last part again. Yeah. Uh, and are we at the same time developing our inner ability for perception? Do you understand? Uh, just the last word for perception. Perception? perception inner perception. Example. Yeah, perception. Okay. Now, this, well, we're doing, uh, we're doing all of that. Interesting question to me because this, uh, I have uh, written a book named uh, Evolution of Consciousness, and this is very, uh, <clears throat> very close topic to me, and uh, that's why I like to. Uh, hear your thoughts that uh, about this uh, uh, are we evolving our uh, <coughs> consciousness uh, as a consciousness and uh, is this a way to uh, have a perceive uh, new di dimensions and and uh, <coughs> and this kind of uh, this kind of things if you well <coughs> well all those things go together but let me try to put it in a, a perspective, and that is that as consciousness evolves, that evolution is defined as lowering entropy, okay? In my model, that's, that's lowering entropy. More information, better information, more usable. In other words, the content, the meaning, the significance gets greater and greater. That's the, that's the, uh, that's where we're going. And that is also in direction between toward becoming love, caring, social systems, optimizing, you know, it's about other. So that is the direction of evolution of consciousness toward love, becoming love, caring about other. Now, as you do that, you have to let go of fear. Matter of fact, I should say to do that, you have to let go of fear. If you were able just to let go of all your fear, huh, you'd be there. What would be left? If you got rid of all your fear. You'd also wouldn't have any ego and you wouldn't have any beliefs. You would be love. So it's not that you have to do something special to become love. What you have to do is get rid of the fear. It's the fear that keeps us from actualizing all of our potential. So evolving your consciousness means getting rid of your fear. That's another thing that it means. When you do that, in the process of doing that, your awareness, that's consciousness, your awareness starts seeing bigger pictures. So you become aware of larger, the, the larger reality. You become aware of these databases. You don't see them necessarily as databases. You just know there's information that's available. You know, my, my concept of database is a, is a uh, metaphor. Information is available. Okay. 
and you you uh, realize that there are things that you can do with your mind. You can connect telepathically with another person. If there's somebody having trouble, you can calm them down. You can have a chat with them. You can counsel them. You can give them energy. You can make them feel better. If they're ill, you can help solve their, their illness. There's all sorts of things that you can do to help from these other dimensions, if you will. Mm -hmm. All of that just becomes available to you to use and because you're now consciousness you have bigger picture it's the fear that keeps you down to this little tiny picture in this little physical you know virtual reality and your whole life is about what happens here in this little physical place then you're very limited you kind of it's like the elf who can't get outside a you know world of warcraft well he's stuck in there doing elf stuff whatever elf stuff is you know that's what he does and that's the only thing he does. And he runs around in that map and he rescues damsels in distress, perhaps, and, and uh, you know, finds gold and wins battles and does things. And that's it. That's all he does. He just does different versions of that. Well, that's what people do who are just stuck in the physical. They just keep doing different versions of physical stuff. So they're extremely limited. As you evolve, you realize, oh, I'm consciousness. Oh, well, once you get to the point that you see yourself as consciousness, you realize consciousness isn't limited just to this physical reality. Consciousness is a lot bigger playground. You know, you can, you can go outside the school and you don't have that just a little, a little playground connected to your schoolhouse. You can go out the other door into the wide, wide world of consciousness and explore it. See what's there. Learn from it. Help other people with it. Right, using your intent, be helpful to others, see problems, solve problems, help others solve problems. You've got a bigger perspective on things now. You know, it's like when you look downstream at where you've been and you see other people and you see they're struggling just like you were struggling. You know, you say, well, yeah, 10, 15 years ago, that was me. I was the hunter. I was struggling all that, you know, and you know exactly what's in their minds. You know exactly how they feel. You feel their pain. I mean, it's just, you've been there and done that. That's the way downstream looks. And you can be very helpful to those people because you understand where they are. Now, they may not be ready for help. They just may be in their struggle and there's nothing you can do to help them. But at least you understand it precisely. You know where they want to, what's, what's wrong, where their problems are. And you realize that most everything that causes them grief is self-created. But if they were open to your help, you could be very helpful to them. But they have to grow up to the point that they're ready for that help. Now, you look upstream, and everything's a mystery. Downstream, everything's clear. Upstream, everything is a big mystery. You don't know what's going on up there. You know, it's, it's all totally foreign and confusing and doesn't make sense and hard to get your mind wrapped around it. So that's the way things always are. So when you get to the point where you've developed your intuitive sides, you've let go of your fear, you've become, you've taken some big steps toward becoming love. Now you're way upstream from where you used to be. Awful lot of the world seems pretty obvious to you what's going on and what they're doing and why they're doing it. You can look at all of it and say, yeah, I know right where those people are. But they have to be ready and they have to ask in order for you to help them. You can't just barge in and say, hey, I know what you need. Listen to me. <laughs> that doesn't work. All they'll do is you know, punch you probably. That uh, doesn't help. That just makes you part of the problem. So in any case, yes, you do start acting ways and being ways at higher levels in higher dimensions if you will from intuitive spaces you can appreciate where others are and when you appreciate what others are what it does for you is that instead of saying oh look at those hard awful stinking people they are so miserable they keep doing this they keep doing that they must be you know dumber than dirt you know instead of you having that negative attitude you look at those peoples and say, yeah, I can see where they are. 
They're struggling. They're doing the best they can with what they got. They're just trying to survive. They're just trying to grab, you know, whatever it is they can grab. They, they don't care a whole lot about other people. They're very self-centered and self-focused, but that's just the way they are. And instead of being angry and upset and negative, you have compassion for them. You, you're compassionate. You say, yeah, I'm glad I'm not there any longer because you remember when you were there and had those attitudes. So that gives you this bigger picture, makes you more likely to be helped. And you do that because your perspective sees more than just what's in the physical. You see the physical, but you see a lot of the non-physical. You see a lot of the, the spiritual dysfunction, the emotional dysfunction, even the intellectual dysfunction. You can see all that and understand it really well which makes you a, you want to help. So, you know, you start some kind of podcast or you start some kind of way of making movies or doing things that you think might help. You start putting your energies into being part of the solution. And yes, so that's what I, if, you know, that's what I would define as those higher dimensions. It's not that your evolution is to get to the higher dimensions. It's that your higher dimensions become available to you as you evolve. And that evolution is the growing up thing. So it's not that we're evolving into higher spaces where we can still, um, what? We can still express our fear and our, you know, and our insecurity and all those other things, you know, and our meanness or our self-centered, we can still express that, but at a higher level from a higher dimension. No, it's not like that. It's that as we grow up and get rid of that fear and ego and, and beliefs, we can function at a higher, from a higher dimension. And we see more than what's just physical. We can see that the physical is just a piece of it. The physical is just a stage we're all playing on. You know, the, that's the stage. What's important are the people on the stage and what's driving them. And you can see that. So <clears throat> yes, higher dimensions, you can get around and explore uh, our, our inner space and realize that this isn't the only virtual reality in town. There's other virtual realities going on. And there's literally thousands and millions of people engaged in other virtual reality systems besides this one. It's not our universe it's somebody else's universe and you can experience that and interact with it so you get to do those kinds of things you can interact with probable futures you can interact with probable past you can go back and say well what if i'd made this choice instead of that choice what's the difference and how could i have been better at making that better choice you know what was it that led me to that poor choice and you can really understand it and when you do that it's not as like you're going to make that choice. Whereas most people make bad choices and then they make another one just like it. And then another one just like it. They keep on making those same bad choices because they never really see it as a bad choice. They see it as the best and necessary choice they had to make. They don't see it as a poor choice. They don't realize they had other choices. So there's a lot of things you can do from higher dimensions that can help you grow up as well and help other people, but you get those by evolving the quality of your consciousness. There is an association between experiencing these uh, larger dimensions, as you say, and evolving your quad, evolving your consciousness. Yes, those two things do go together, but it's not that you're doing one in order to get the other, it's that you're evolving the quality of your consciousness. That's evolve or de-evolve that's you know it's like in our physical in this virtual reality the physical universe it's there's two criteria there's uh, survive and procreate and if you can survive and procreate well you're going to hang in there if you're not good at one of those you're not you know you're going to disappear well, for consciousness, it's just one criteria, and that is lower your entropy. So you constantly have to be working on lowering the entropy, because if you don't, well, eventually you just won't be here anymore. You'll disappear. So it's lower your entropy or die. So the system, you know, your, your 
you're evolving your consciousness is really an entropy lowering process, which is a becoming love process. And <clears throat> that's fundamental. The fact that you gain access to useful, you can call them dimensions or areas or information that you didn't have access before. That's just another one of the advantages of growing up. You've, you've grown up enough that you can use those additional resources rather than abuse them. Yes. Uh, if we are talking about uh, consciousness, uh, uh, you have uh, mentioned that there is this uh, uh, larger consciousness, which means uh, uh, the souls. And then there is this uh, individual uh, unit uh, consciousness, which is us. And uh, what do you think about the uh, collective consciousness? Does it also exist? Yes, collective consciousness exists, absolutely. Um, first, I would say that the, the larger consciousness system is a metaphor for source, and uh, individuated unit of consciousness is a, is a metaphor basically for the player. Mm. In the individual player. My model is made up of metaphors and is not to be taken literally. Yes. It's not, we're not looking for literal things here. We're looking for conceptual. Mm. You know, it, my model is a, is a conceptual model, not a literal model. Now, if your metaphors are really, really good, the conceptual model might be very much like the literal model, but that's just a guess. So, you know, I don't, I tell people to be aware that all of the things in my model are metaphors mm -hmm. for, for, for attributes of consciousness, parts of consciousness that have to exist. Logically, they're necessary. I make a name for them, like source is necessary. So I make a name for that and put it in my <clears throat> my model. So that, now what about uh, collective consciousness? Collective consciousness works like this. If you, if, if you feel in your mind <clears throat> that you are a member of a collective, and that collective could be a family, it could be you know, a religion, it could be a job, it could be a, a career, it could be all, uh, oh, I don't know, all, uh, you know, waste disposal engineers, you know, that could be a collective. So it could be anything, really. It could be a, a Sunday school or a, <clears throat> a nation. If it's a nation, then the collective consciousness of a nation is generally called a culture. So the collective consciousness is basically the vector sum of all the individuated units of consciousness that make up the collective. And you get to make up the collective just by having an intention that you're a part of it. If, you're, if you see yourself as a part of it, then you are. If others in that collective also see you as a part of it, then you're it. You know, so you have to see yourself and they have to see you. <clears throat> then you're a part of that collective. So say uh, if you work at General Motors, then there will be a kind of a collective consciousness that's General Motors. And you'll notice that the people at General Motors will all wear blue shirts, uh, slacks, uh, you know, all the executive level will wear, will wear uh, ties, but there'll be sports jackets and probably not vests and they'll leave their coats in the office and just wear their shirts and ties when they walk. You know, they'll have their own ways of doing things and everybody will kind of follow that. So they'll have their way of dressing. They'll have their way of presenting and interacting. They will have a corporate culture is what it's called. So that's just a collective consciousness. Now you can work at General Motors and just not be a part of it. 
you can say, yeah, okay, everybody does this and that, but I don't want to, I'm wearing blue jeans or, or shorts or something else. And if they don't like it, you know, they can lump it and you can go your own way, but then you're not really a part of that collective consciousness. You're not accepting it. So you're not a part of it. So collective consciousness comes on all levels. So you could be a member of 10 different collective consciousnesses or more. You might start with a family. So let's say a close knit family where all the people in the family, they uh, take care of each other. They're, you know, their family is very, very important to them. Well, though, there's a little collective consciousness going on in that family. Like I say, in a nation, it's called culture. It's the vector sum of all the people that are part of it and what they bring to it. Now in a, in a group of people who are angry, it's called a mob. And the mob has a collective consciousness and you have a bunch of angry people and the mob is angrier than any of them. So people in a collective consciousness share their themselves, their attitudes, their feelings, their fears, their hopes. They share similar things. And that's because it is a collective of all of that. So you join a collective consciousness, you change that collective consciousness by a little bit because you join it because you're one of say a thousand. So you change it by changing one element of a thousand. But the, oh, those other 999, they help change you because now you start to become more and more like the collective of which you're a part. And if you're just sort of in that group, you haven't really, you don't really see yourself as a part, then it won't change you as much. And you really deeply identify with that group, it'll change you a lot. So it depends. So we have all sorts of cultures, collective consciousness. It's what uh, Jung, Carl Jung talked about um, archetypes. Mm -hmm. Archetypes are basically collective consciousness. And you can have collective consciousness at the level of Homo sapien. There'll be a collective conscious there at the species level. And it'll come down from the species level, I guess, kind of the next level down is probably uh, ethnic, you know, ethnic level, national level, then local kind of levels, and then things like church and work and home and all of those are all part of it. But the collective consciousness will modify how you see things, mm -hmm. what you believe, what your beliefs are, what your fears are. You'll pick that up out of the collective consciousness. So it is a it is a real thing, and it can be a very you know a very pervasive thing. Another collective consciousness thing. Remember, uh, I don't know, a decade ago, there were uh, beanie babies, and everybody had to have a beanie baby. At least in my culture, there was. <laughs> Maybe not in your culture. Your your, your culture is different than mine, and you know you'd see pictures of uh, particularly ladies lined up 50 60 people lined up to get in the store you know it's five o'clock in the morning you know three hours before the store opens and all these people are lining up so that they can get a beanie baby uh, cabbage patch dolls hula hoops all these things we call fads tend to be a collective conscious that's created by marketing make people see that they're a part of something Oh, hula hoop. If you're young and energetic and have a lot of spirit, you know, then you're a hula hoop kind of person. And you need to go out and get one and show people how fit you are and capable you are and so on. And pretty soon, if they're lucky, they'll end up with a collective conscious built up around their product and it'll become a fad. You know, six months later, it's not a fad anymore. It's done. Okay, so there's those kind. And then there, there's other sorts, but yeah, it's the same thing as Jung and his, and his archetypes. There's archetypes um, for almost every level of human organization. Yes. If I'm thinking about uh, how this uh, collective consciousness affects, uh, um, uh, I can uh, take one example from uh, Finland and um, uh, we, quite many people here say that uh, uh, this kind of spiritual awakening is uh, spreading uh, all over the place here. And, uh, and I can see it uh, from uh, those uh, 
uh, <clears throat> statistic of uh, how much people has watched our uh, spiritual uh, documentaries and so on. And I see that uh, this is happening and, and uh, it seems that uh, this kind of spiritual awakening, it also uh, goes to the, our collective consciousness and it's spreading from that. What do you think? Yes. Yes, indeed. I would agree. It is spreading. It tends to be growing right now. People are acting differently. Uh, look at the, look at the COVID-19 mm -hmm. experience that we're having now. Flus have been going around yearly almost forever. You know, you're back a hundred years. There's still flus going around, you know, every, every year. Mm -hmm. And up until now, the attitude was, well, it's flu season, people get the flu. Oh yeah, sometimes the flu is bad. Usually you have, you know, thousands of older people and, and sometimes younger, very young and very old or vulnerable, sometimes just the old, sometimes more the young, depends on the flu, but there'll be some people more vulnerable than others and those people will get it and out of the ones that get it, there's gonna be two or 3% of them are gonna die. I mean, the time the flu, because it's so, easy to catch it you know it's so uh, what's the word uh, it's so efficient in the way it spreads itself <clears throat> that that a lot of people will get it you know mm -hmm. lots and lots of people end up getting it because it's it spreads so easily therefore there will be 10,000 20,000 100,000 dead people by the time it's gone mm -hmm. and it's just life's like that that's the way it is mm -hmm. so for year after year after year yeah, it's flu season. I don't know, 100,000 100, people get killed and we go on. It's not that big a deal. People get ill. They don't come into work if they're feeling bad enough that they can't work. But if they feel like they can work, even though they still have the sniffles or a low grade fever, they'll come into work anyway. They don't particularly, you know, they, as long as they're fit for work, then they'll come in. Whether they're sick or not, they just can't be too sick. <clears throat> so life just goes on pretty much as usual. People get sick, people get over it, people die. Mm. So, you know, it's just a fact of living here. Yeah. Didn't happen this time. This time, people took responsibility for not passing it on to people who would die. People realize that, you know, if we just do some simple things like distancing or wear a mask, we could keep two thirds, maybe 75% of those people that die, we keep them from dying. They don't have to die. If we were just responsible enough to not let the not let that virus spread as wide, you know, and as quickly as it does, we could save a lot of people's lives and that's worth doing. All right. It's inconvenient. The distancing's inconvenient. Can't go to the can't go to the concert, you know. Can't do the other things that I want to do, but it's okay. I will, I will uh, suffer the consequences in order to not be a part of that problem. To be a part of the solution is to not spread that disease. So people did that, and they did stay home, and work did close down, and governments did make rules about wearing masks and no groups, no large groups coming together. And everybody saw that as, as a kind of a temporary thing that we should do mm. to protect our older people rather than just saying, eh, that's life. Yeah, 100,000 people die. Life goes on. So why this year was it any different? Why did we this year do it very differently? We didn't just ignore it. I mean, I remember when I was very young, uh, there were so few kids in school and so few teachers left to teach them that they just closed the schools down. That happens pretty routinely because most everybody was sick. A lot of people died, no doubt. Uh, probably hundreds of thousands of people died, but nobody thought that it was had anything to do with their responsibility. What happened is that a shift in self-centeredness occurred. We're less self-centered than we were. 
Mm. Last flu season, eh, it's not us. I'm not going to die. And maybe my grandparents aren't going to die or my parents aren't going to die. So life's like that. We'll see. Hope we all make it kind of an attitude. That's a very self-centered attitude. It's about me. And if it's not about you and it's about other, then it's, well, what can I do to help other? What can I do to make other people, you know, have better lives? And well, what you can do is not get this disease and pass it on. That's what you can do. So people did. They took it seriously. So I agree with you. I think there's a big change, mm -hmm. even just in a year, even just from last few flu season to this flu season. Yes, this one was maybe a little scarier because it was a little easier to pass along. It was even more infectious than, than other ones have been. But not really that much more. Mm -hmm. The big difference wasn't that the, it was a, a terror of a disease. The big difference was that people took responsibility to care about other people. Indeed. And what wow, I was you know, very that's... happy about it was that uh, there was this time a uh, human was much more valuable than a Yes. Mass. Yeah. Lovely. Exactly. Yeah. So we even thought about it, you know, and, and we're willing to make the sacrifices to do it because it was the right thing to do. So that shows a lot. Now, once that happened and started happening, then that starts a collective consciousness growing about it. So once that attitude started and you start seeing it in this country and that country and they're trying to do things, then people realize, oh, we have a choice. You know, they've always had a choice, but they didn't really recognize it. They didn't see staying home as a choice. I couldn't stay home, I'd be fired. You know, they're not going to stay home. So they never saw that choice before. But now they see a choice and they say they make it. And the company sees a choice and says, yeah, you guys, why don't you work from home? And, you know, the whole thing just changed and built up its own collective consciousness with it. That, of course, you try to save the older generation. They may have another 10 or 20 years left. Yes. Just tossing, tossing them out like that is, you know, it's just wrong. It's not caring. So, yeah, that's what, that's what developed. And it is a, it is a thing that is developing among us. We're growing up, so we're seeing things a little differently. We humans. But besides that, we are coming to a time that all of the necessary conditions, processes, and, and what, and, and things are available to us to make a very large step forward in our spiritual development, to grow up. And it's never happened before. It's only now, only currently, that all of the things have come together that are required for humanity to take a big step forward in conscious evolution. So the first time since a human race crawl out of the trees, you know, have we had this opportunity? We've been stuck in, uh, you know, what warlord organizational types just up until, you know, the last five, six, 700 years. Has that, has that changed much? So there hadn't been a lot of change for a long time. And now we're changing. And before, you always had people who understood the big picture. Buddha understood the big picture. He said that this was a virtual reality, but he didn't say it that way. He said this, this reality was an illusion. Well, you know, an illusion, a virtual reality. It's the same concept. Yes, it's not real. It's not the real thing. It's not the thing that matters. You know, it's, it's an illusion. So people always got that, you know, people understood that love is the answer and that's what we need to evolve to. And that's been around for 3000 years. People have understood that, but it's always been local. It's always been a bubble. So yeah, Siddhartha gets out and he wanders around and a bunch of people wander around with him. They all go off and live in the bushes and, you know, he teaches and they learn and, so on, and it spreads, and now it spreads all over Asia, 
and spreads this way and it goes to Japan and now it's Zen Buddhism, but it's all just kind of the same sort of thing. And you had, of course, Buddha, you know, came from his own tradition, right? There was Krishna you know, before there was a, a Buddha, you know, and you had the Hindus and, and Buddha was a Hindu. So he, uh, he got more back to basics again, just like reformers tend to do, but all the basics were still there. So it'd been around for, for millennia, these ideas, but they've always been sort of local and they've always been on the sideline, in the margins. They've never been, well, I shouldn't say never, they were taken seriously and were the main line up to about, what, uh, 200 years ago, 300 years ago. And that's when the church was the was kind of the ruler the church had the had this way you, you looked to the to the high priests in the church to tell you what was right and what was wrong mm -hmm. and at that time religion held sway but religion is of the people by the people for the people and pretty soon it was just as full of fear and full of ego and full of other things as the people were and it, uh, over time, degenerated into some spirituality and some stuff that was just as bad and just as, just as raunchy as, as, the, uh, as the secular world. Mm -hmm. So you had all of that, and you had the secular world that was separate from the religious world. That's kind of two different worlds. And then you had science. Then the sciences became the high priests of at least Western culture. And the scientists told everybody what to believe and what not to believe. So all of this is, is kind of building up. But the scientists, they drew this line and said, okay, science and objectivity is over here and religion and that stuff, that's over there. And we don't have anything to do with that. So again, it's split off. There's two different, two different groups. And scientists, indeed, could also be religious. They didn't let one necessarily interfere with the other. Many of them were, were atheists, but... Not all of them. Some of them were very religious. And the religious ones didn't really see a conflict. Well, when I go into the lab, I'm a scientist and I do science things. When I come home, I'm religious and I do religious things. And for them, there was no conflict. There was basically in the sense that the underlying ethic of science was materialism, determinism. But they just said, yeah, they accepted that and accepted the other and didn't mind the logical con conflicts between the two. So they didn't feel necessary to choose one or the other. So there was some of those. But now we've come around to the point where science is deriving the non-physical, right? The, the quantum theorists are saying we live in a in a computed reality, that this is an information-based reality. So they're, they've come to that conclusion. So physics has finally broke through to find out what reality is all about and find out that it's not materialism. But they don't know what to do with that. And they don't want to say it that way because that's scary because they don't know what else to say. They don't know what else to put in there. So they kind of leave it at that. But at least that, that's set. So then now people like me and others come along and say, well, you know, science is really just a subset of consciousness or something bigger. And here's a logical, here's the logical framework in which you can see the whole logic. And here's, here's, uh, you know, here's why we exist. Here's what we're here for. Here's how things work. Here's a, a logical explanation of how everything works. And it's non exclusionary. There's nothing to believe. There's no collection plates being passed. There, you know, you don't, you don't become an ism of any sort. It's not a thing that you have for and against. It's just a set of attitudes and understandings that people have that are logical and make sense. Yes. So that, that makes it different. It's a, it's a different thing. And it's inclusive in that you can have an atheist say, ah, I knew it all along. There's no, there's no God, you know, some the big guy with the long white beard that's playing with his pet people, you know, there's nothing like that going on. 
And the theist can say, ah, see, I knew it all along. There is a source, and that source is conscious, and it's aware, and, you know, love is the answer, and it's helping, it, you know, it helps us succeed in, in growing up. It's a personal connection that we have to the source. So both of them, both you think would be absolutely impossible to agree on anything, both the theist and the atheist can, can come to this concept and find a home in it for themselves and for explaining you know, their ideas to. So in that sense, if we can get more people to see the idea that it's an entirely inclusive idea that love is the answer. Now, I'm not the only one saying love is the answer. There's been, thousands of, there's been thousands of people been saying love is the answer for millennia. Yeah. You see, all I've done is put it in a different context. I put it into a different metaphors and a different kind of model. Mm. And I've done it logically so you can see how, how logically you can go deductively from beginning assumption to end to developing physics or developing love is the answer. So you can make that all in a logical thing. That's what's different. It's just the model is different. Mm. Buddha had a model, you know, but it, it was poetry. In poetry, people have to interpret it. And if you have to interpret it, then there's always going to be arguments in different sects and different groups. Mine doesn't have any interpretation. Mine's just logic. You either follow it or you don't. You know, it's, it's, it's just if you, if you agree that we start here with consciousness and evolution and we're going to end up over here on this other side, it's just logic. Couldn't end up any other way. So that's, the, that's kind of the idea. And I see it all coming together in a big moment. Here we are trying to grow up. We are the, a large part of the system strategy for growing up. The system wants us to succeed. It even cheats a little on the sides where it can't be noticed to help us succeed. So we finally have the high priests of science who have always in the past said, well, religion, that's just bogus nonsense because where's the proof? Now, those same high priests are saying, this is a virtual reality. This is a computed reality. It's information-based, although they're not quite saying that yet. They're close. They're very close. Once they have theory that they can put in there to see how physics comes out of it, it'll be a lot easier going there. Right now, they just don't have, you know, again, like they did at the double slit experiment, banging their head against the wall. They don't have anything to put in there. So they're afraid of it. So anyway, when the, when the uh, scientists eventually get to the point that they say, yay, verily, this is a virtual reality. We've decided that nothing else fits the data. This is a, this is a computed reality. When they say that, that's going to start a huge wave. Because the scientists don't want to go to, is, there, is this programmed? And if so, who's the programmer? And you know, they don't want to go there. That's not science. But yeah. they will say it looks, it's a virtual reality. So the scientists will be happy with that, but nobody else will. Everybody else is going to say, yeah, okay, then who's the programmer? <laughs> you know, where'd it come from? If it's a virtual reality, it has to come from somewhere else. And, and what is it and why is it? And there'll be all these questions, just be a wave when the high priests make the announcement that this is a virtual reality and they're getting closer and closer and closer to that. When they do, my mental picture is there's this huge ball sitting on the top of a very tall mountain and the physicists have these big pry bars. It balls right next to the edge of the mountain. The physicists have these big pry bars called virtual reality. And when they make that choice that this is a virtual reality and they say that and people Except that, now that'll take decades in itself probably. But as that happens, that's going to push that ball over that edge. Mm -hmm. And the scientists won't mean that that to really be a big deal. I said, well, we don't have to go there. You know, we, don't, we don't have any proof about there. So we don't want to go there. But everybody else is going to want to go there. Because other people aren't intimidated by materialism enough to have to not go there. Mm -hmm. So everybody else will go there. And these 
these questions now will be legitimate and not in the margin because science has said that this is a virtual reality. It's an information-based reality. That makes it a fact, not a theory, not a, uh, not a religion. That makes it a fact. And that makes all the difference in the world. Instead of staying in the margins, now it can go mainstream. It's going to create a huge conversation and a lot of confusion and a lot of bickering and arguments and all kinds of stuff will happen. But at the same time, we have the internet. We can have a global conversation, just like we have a global conversation about COVID-19. I mean, that's not... That's not a country talking about that. That's a global conversation about what to do and how to do it and what's successful and what's not. It's a global conversation about COVID-19. There'll be a global conversation about who's the programmer and what's it all about and why is it like this and what does that mean? You know, what are the logical consequences of that? And there'll be all kinds of stuff going on that will be non-productive, of course, but there's at least a chance that when it does settles, a whole bunch of people will realize that what they're here for is to care about other people and that that's important. Mm -hmm. And they're developing that way already. They're being nudged in that direction. We're seeing it with COVID. This, this idea that there is a component to us called spiritual. We do have, you know, body and spirit. These are two aspects, physical and non-physical. The non-physical isn't just rubbish that the scientists throw away and say, ah, where's the proof? You have objective and subjective. The subjective world is important. Matter of fact, it's more important than the objective world. It's in the subjective world where all the important stuff is. That's where all the love and the caring and the relationship and all of that stuff is in the subjective world, not in the objective world. So as we see, as we take all that seriously, we are ripe for a big leap forward in evolution of consciousness where we can get a collective consciousness going with this bubble, complicated, makes the relationships get better, you know, as, as they do that. I see the possibility of a big change. Now, not necessarily that change will happen. I think it will happen eventually. It may not happen soon whether that takes us a, a, another thousand years or it takes us another hundred or only another 20 or 30, I don't know. But at least we can do it now. Yes. Whereas before, we didn't have the high priests. Okay, they told people what to believe, but then there was the secular part of the world that was at least as large and powerful that didn't have to pay any attention to that. But now everybody pays attention to the scientists. They have the whole world that's... You know, agrees that science is what tells you the truth. So when a scientist say that, it's mainstream. You can't just say, yeah, but where's the proof? The scientist said it. That will make all the difference. We have an internet. People can talk about it. People can see it. Opinions can come and go. You know, there'll be lots of things going on. So the work that you're doing, the work that I'm doing, the work that 10,000 other people are doing in this kind of new interest in spirituality, all of that is there, I think, coming together for this big possibility, this big crescendo that will happen in the future. Even back, if you look at the 1800s, back in the 1800s, paranormal things got to be a real interesting thing. And scientists were going out and studying them, and there was table, table tapping, and tables would float up, and ectoplasm would ooze out of people and do things. And, you know, they had all of this, this paranormal stuff. And that's when theosophy got its root. Theosophy. And there's a couple of other things that caught on in France and Germany. And, you know, just, it was kind of everywhere that people were open to these kinds of ideas. And then after a while, that kind of closed down again. But for a while, there was openness. That openness occurred so that we could have our openness now. That openness occurred so that in 1950-something, uh, what's-his-name could start a parapsychology lab at Duke University, the Ryan Institute. J.B. Ryan was able to do that. And it has its 
in Europe, things like that happen too. I know mostly the stuff that happened here, but things could start up, but now they were science. This was a parapsychology laboratory. It was being studied as a science. That wouldn't have happened if we didn't have the 1800s set it up. So it's all been building. And now it's gotten to the point that you're right. There's this big wave that is taking it all more seriously, looking at it, being more open toward it, not being fooled by the determinism, materialism thing, seeing bigger pictures. Right at the time the physicists are ready to roll that ball off the edge with an announcement of this being a, a, a information-based reality is how they'll say it. But that'll just start the conversation going. It'll start with the eggheads. It'll start with all the left-brainers who say, information, what does that mean? What are, the, you know, what are the implications of that? And they'll realize, well, that means it's computed. It's information. And that means, and so on it goes. You see, that ball is, is rolling. So I also see the system nudging it. I see the LCS, the larger conscious system, kind of nudging it too nudging people to take this more seriously, nudging people to care about old people not getting you know, COVID-19. I see the system nudging those sorts of things and encouraging people all over the globe to discuss it, make, make videos about it, um, you know, put it out on, on again, the internet. It doesn't have to, uh, it doesn't have to meet the approval of the mass media moguls. Mm. They'd still love us looking at sitcoms, you know, but we have an internet. You don't have to look at sitcoms. <laughs> you can go on to the internet and find out all kinds of things. You don't have those people in your, in your path anymore. That, would just, that was just another hindrance. So I don't think this thing we're getting to could happen without the internet. I don't think it will happen without the physicist starting it off with virtual reality. I think those are kind of key things, but we got the internet. We've got a lot of people with positive open minds. We've got quantum mechanics about ready to break open. And you know, uh, what's his name? Uh, Planck, Max Planck said, mm -hmm. physics progresses one funeral at a time. Meaning that as the old guard dies off, the newer people come in with newer ideas. And that's what's going on now. All the older guys in physics right now all cut their teeth on Newton. You know, the, the quantum physics, whatever, kind of new stuff, and they never quite felt right to them. So in another two or three or four decades, that won't be the case. The newer people, yeah, weird science, we understand, you know, we live with that, that's okay. They won't have any uneasy feelings about it, yeah, talking about the uh, computed realities won't be so bad. So as time goes by, physics is going to be more and more ready to say this is a virtual reality. Already there's a, like there's a whole group in physics called digital physics that basically sees this as a virtual reality. And that's two decades old now. You know, so it's a growing thing and eventually it'll dominate because it is better physics. Yeah. That's the that's what matters. You know, it is actually better physics. It it explains things and doesn't create any more mysteries. Solves mysteries without creating any new mysteries. So that's I see what's coming down the pike. Could be as soon as a decade or two decades. I don't know it'll be much faster than that, but could be much longer. I really hope that uh a similar um, consciousness and uh, will spread uh, when we're talking about, uh, example, envir environmental issues, because this our nature needs also love. And we all Finns who live here, we are living uh, with uh, 168,000 lakes and 200,000 uh, islands, and uh, we have a lot of nature here. And we, every Finns knows that when you go to nature, it will heal you. It will give you mm -hmm. energy. It will make you feel better. Everybody knows that there is uh, nature which has a consciousness, mm -hmm. and this um, consciousness is healing you. And uh, that's why we Finns uh, are very close of our nature. And 
we are thinking about uh, about those environmental issues what is going on in the world and i hope that similar uh, awakening what happens with covid-19 would happen also with the nature yes well you see what nature does for people is that it helps them let go of all their fears yeah. all those fears and all their negativity you know, they have all this negativity going on and you you walk out into a beautiful space and just sit there and be a part of it and a lot of that negativity just melts away it doesn't the nature doesn't sustain that negativity whereas you go watch a movie uh, go turn on the tv go to work there's all kinds of stuff going up that on that sustains that negativity it's just constantly kind of pumping up the negativity pumping up the fear but turn all that stuff off <laughs> go out and sit down in a beautiful place and feel connected to it and a lot of that negativity just quits unfortunately people then feel a whole lot better and they go right back into it and turn the tv back on and go back to work and you know it all comes yeah. right back again it's not it doesn't last that long but it feels really good when it's there and it is healing most of the illnesses we have are stress related that negativity causes it, that stress most of our illnesses are stress related physical illnesses aches and pains and bad backs and headaches and all that stuff has a very high component in stress in tension in which is basically negativity so yes indeed we we are ready to make big changes and having a a beautiful scenery to be in is helpful you know it helps us see that part it helps us not let go of that part whereas you get somebody who lives in a big city and they never see anything but you know concrete and glass and steel after a few years of that you forget that that nature's even out there yeah you know? so you carry that angst and that anger and and that negativity around with you everywhere 24/7 you know 365 days a year you always carry that around you never you don't have that but at least you fins know that there there is nature out there and that the uh, the world doesn't have to be so full of struggle and pain it doesn't have to be what do you think about uh, this uh, um our uh, consciousness when it's in evolving uh, where it will lead us uh, what will be that kind of uh, uh, new world what we are entering uh, there is uh, lots of claims about it that uh, that we are uh, entering the golden age and uh, and the consciousness is uh, uh, taking us uh, to uh, among example those uh, star travelers and so on and so on what are your thoughts uh, when we talking about mpt theories where this uh, uh, developing of consciousness will lead us well we have to look when we look at the political and social change and economic change we have to look at what the problem really is the problem that our world is so inhospitable so mean spirited so greedy is because that's the way we are it's the low quality consciousness of us we humans so you don't fix you don't fix it by i say getting rid of this politician and get rid of that uh, industrialist or that ceo that doesn't fix it all that does is fix a symptom you know that's that's like putting bandaid on a on a wound it doesn't fix the wound it just it's symptomatic relief So what happens is that when people become kinder, gentler, more caring, all these institutions, the politics, the economics, the the law, all the institutions that we've created, they will just change. They represent us. They're a good representation of us, who we are. We create this reality by being who we are. When we change, all of that will just change by itself. it'll just you know the right people for those jobs will show up and the old ones will disappear it'll all just i mean it won't be 
It's not like it's, you're going to wake up one morning and everything will be fixed. It's going to take, you know, decades of struggle and heartache and shouting and hollering and fires and guns. And it's going to take a whole lot of stuff to happen that's ugly before we get through it. But basically, it will just change itself. It's not that you have to go in and replace anybody or change anything. Any, you know, we talk about competing economic systems. We have a communist system, we have socialist systems, we have capitalist systems. There's kind of the three uh, most common uh, systems these days. If you were in any one of those systems and you had a population of high quality consciousness, the system would change to something that was good for everybody. So it doesn't matter really where you start. As long as the people grow up, then it'll just morph into being whatever it needs to be. So we don't have to find the perfect economic system and the perfect way to do it. It'll find itself. That's just obvious. What we want to do is give everybody as much individual opportunity as possible. Everybody has the largest set of choices possible. Everybody can be almost anything. The only thing that limits them is themselves, their own beliefs, their own limitations. So that's what we want to get to, where, where everybody is set free, where you can decide one day, you know, I don't know, I don't want to do this anymore. I want to do something else. Well, there you go. Go do it. The system will, will, keep, will probably take care of you until you do that, because the system needs that thing it is that you want to do. So it will work like, or if you just want to be a poet or a painter, well, that's good too, because we value the arts. That, that's a contributive source that our environments are, are pleasant and positive. So that's good. So I would think that we are looking for a, a situation for governments and for economic systems that optimize for everyone. And when you optimize for every individual, you also optimize for the whole. And I think that's where we'll go. And those systems will just naturally go that way as long as they have kind, caring, you know, compassionate people in them. It's when you get self-centered and, and selfish and, and power-hungry people that stuff goes wrong. So how you fix all these institutions is fixing ourselves. Institutions will fix themselves too because they'll have high quality people in them and they'll just do the right thing for the right reason because that's what high quality people do. Yes. Yeah. yeah, so that's that's where, that's how I see it going. But again, that's gonna take probably a few uh, generations worth of change. You know, That's not gonna happen in a, in a decade, it's going to be a while, but that's wonderful change. You know, that's very hopeful change, and it should be a very hopeful time that people will be uh, looking forward to it. But, you know, people will find something to complain about anyway, but I'm hoping that as they grow up, there'll be fewer and fewer complainers among us, because complaining is part of the problem, not part of the solution. So there'll be fewer people complaining, fewer people, whatever, and the institutions will just change to suit us. But we have to grow up. If we only halfway grow up and still have half as much fear as we had before, then our institutions will only halfway grow up and will still have half the greed and dysfunction <laughs> that they had before. It, it just follows us. So we don't have to go out and decide the perfect organizational process call it democratic socialism or you know capitalistic so socialism or we don't have to find that it'll just create itself we don't need the perfect economic system of you know bitcoin or this or that or any other kind of perfect economic system if every player in the economic system isn't trying to rip somebody off but is trying to help the next person trying to just needs enough you know for them to be happy and whatever if they have good people everywhere, then there's no problem. See, that's the thing. So it disappears. So 
I don't, I think we need to look at alternative ways of organizing because we'll have to figure them out. And it's good if you think about them a little bit up front, but they'll develop whether we plan ahead for them earlier, whether we just figure them out when we get there and that won't slow us down a whole lot. They'll be, they'll be totally obvious by the time we get there, what needs to be done. But if we sit here and don't heal ourselves and we're have as low a quality of consciousness as we do, all the planning and all the coming up with, you know, a hundred different ways that everybody could go, you know, uh, and never be hungry and everybody that could find clean water. If we just keep working on things, but we don't change ourselves, nothing much will ever come of it. It'll be a lot of hope that gets dashed. If we don't change ourselves, it won't work or not for long. Even if you have a real benevolent person gets in and let's say they're the dictator and they're benevolent, they're the, they're the, uh, like the old Chinese model of the, uh, you know, the saint that's in charge. Even if you have that, it won't last long. It only lasts as long as that person has the power to force other people to act like they're more grown up. As soon as he no longer has that ability <clears throat> to force other people to act, those other people will return to acting just the way they are if they haven't grown up. So it's not stable, it doesn't last. It has to be us changing ourselves. Indeed. Yeah, it's the only way. Well, I guess now it's all time for the last question. We have been talking quite a lot. Actually, you have been <laughs> talking quite a lot. And yeah. uh, if we're thinking about uh, uh, this day and these moments, uh, what is uh, what you what what advice is you would like to give to those people who are uh, living in this moment and uh, and thinking about what is uh, important uh, things to do in this time in in this uh, life and uh, what what are your guidelines for people? Well, I try to keep them very simple because anything complicated doesn't usually work out so well. So the simplest thing is stay positive. Always be positive. If you get angry, if you're upset, if you're shaking your fist at things, how could those people be so stupid? You know, if that's the way you feel, then you're not being positive. You're being part of the problem. Secondly, take responsibility for all your choices. No excuses that somebody made me mad. You choose to be mad and you choose to get angry. You choose to get upset. Those people out there that refuse to wear masks, they make me mad. You know, well, don't let that happen. Don't get angry. Understand, do what you can do to help. Getting angry never helps. It might seem to help. Oh, if we could just get 20, 50 million people really angry, we could change things. Yes, for a little while, but it wouldn't change things for very long. It would all go to hell in a handbasket again because you haven't actually changed people and you don't change people by getting angry. So that's the point. So I'd say that, and I would tell them to, try to realize that everybody, everybody on the planet, all the people are basically doing the best they can with what they got. What they got includes all of their fear, all their ego, all their beliefs, as well as all their knowledge, all their caring, all their love. It's all, it's all they are. That's what they've got to work with. It's what they are. And most people are just doing the best they can with what they've got. They're struggling. They're in pain, they're feeling terrible, they're not happy, and they're making a lot of very poor choices. But they're doing the best they can with what they've got, and they just have to learn. And you can't force them to learn. Learning comes from the inside out. You can try to help educate them, but never by telling them that they're wrong and never by telling them what to do. They have to grow up on their own. You can give them an environment in which it's easier for them to see their problems and fix them. 
but you can't do much more than that. So have compassion for them. Yes, they make this world kind of a, a nasty place, but accept that. That's the way it is. And then see, what can we do to help these people grow up and not feel that way? Yeah. But being angry at them is certainly not something that's going to help them grow up. Guarantee that is not on their path to growth. So I caution people about that. Another thing I tell them is that personally, if you are not happy, if you feel like you're struggling, if your life has a lot of downs in it and you feel depressed or you feel unhappy, that's fear. That's ego. Those are your beliefs. Start to inspect. What is that fear? Be honest with yourself. What is that fear? And try to get rid of it. Work on it. Don't accept it. Don't excuse it. And fix it. Get rid of it. And oh, let's see, what's the last kind of advice that you'd like to give people? And that is if they can get rid of that fear, everything will get better. Their lives will be happier. Their relationships will be much better. They'll get along with people. They'll do better at work. Everybody will like them better. They'll like themselves better. And just by getting rid of that fear. So if they're not as happy as they want to be, that's a result of their own choices, their fears. They need to change it. Sure, maybe they got that fear from their parents or someplace else, but that's not an excuse. You still have what it takes to let go of it and to get rid of it. So just do that. Always stay part of the solution. Never be caught as part of the problem. So I tell people that, and then have fun. Life is supposed to be fun. Life is supposed to be light. You know, laugh a lot, enjoy a lot. Be yourself. Be absolutely who you are. Be sincere. What's the word? Be um, authentic. Have the courage to be authentic and see what that does. Also have the courage to change if your authentic self isn't playing too well. If your authentic self is arrogant, then be aware enough to see that. Somehow your life, now you're yourself, but your life isn't any happier. We'll see why. It's probably because you need to change something. And always realize that the person who needs to change something is you, not somebody else. You can't change anyone but yourself. So just stay right there and change yourself. Don't be concerned about, yeah, but if those people change, then everything would be better. Maybe that's true. Maybe it's just a belief, but do what you can do, which is change yourself. Don't throw up your hands and say, oh, everything's so awful. There's nothing I can do. I'm just one little nobody in the middle of this big mess. I can't affect it. You can. You can be a happy, smiling, satisfied person in the middle of a big mess if you can just let go of your fear. So that gives, should give people some hope and some ideas that, uh, you know, hey, if we're lucky in another couple of decades, maybe this whole thing is going to turn around and we're going to live in a much kinder, gentler, more aware, more caring world. It's possible. We've got everything that it takes to do it. The only thing missing is the will of the people. That's the only ingredient missing. And that's growing. Yeah. These are very wise words. I try to remember myself that uh, when there is difficult times and difficult thoughts and emotions, feelings, that I am not my emotions or my thoughts. I'm just using those. And I have chosen that by myself. Thank you, Tom Campbell. It has been great honor and a great pleasure listening to your wise words and share your wisdom here with the Finnish audience. I hope that someday your path will lead to the Finland. Well, I hope so. I've seen pictures, beautiful place. 
beautiful, beautiful place. That whole Northern Europe is very, very beautiful from the coast all the way in. It's, it's uh, lots of ups and downs and mountains and pretty places. I will get there one day, but thank you, Timo, for calling me up and asking to have this because, you know, Understanding and knowledge by itself is a wonderful thing, but shared understanding and knowledge is much better. Indeed. So that's what we do. You know, we, we try to share it. I talk with people like you because you try to share it with other people. So as you put this out, and maybe the people who speak English and Finland will pick it up quick, but you have subtitles on it and then there'll be another, you know, 50 million, hundred million people that will actually be able to get access to it. That, uh, that's really important. It's really important because when the time comes that that ball starts rolling down that hill, it'll be a much quicker path to gentler and kinder if there's a whole lot of people already primed. If we, if we have to start thinking about it at that point, it'll be a lot longer process. So I'm hoping that uh, I'm willing and happy to have the opportunity that you've given me to help more people at least have the ideas that they can think about. Uh, again, I don't, yeah, I don't want to believe them, but I just, just have the ideas, you know, in their head. That's important. It is. Thank so you. Thank you, sir. Now, yeah, when you, you, when you stop this, you'll have to wait for probably about 20 minutes before it gets done processing the video. So don't just turn everything off. Don't just turn your computer off and walk away. Otherwise you'll lose it. I won't. I won't. I will wait. I don't have any rust to anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. You don't have to attend to it. It does it all by itself, but uh, you can't just turn every, you can't just turn it off. You have to let the thing, usually it yeah, makes an I announcement. Also give uh, my grateful thanks to Finnish uh, audience who has watching uh, this uh, show from uh, from the beginning and uh, all the way to the end. So, kiitoksia yleisölle, jotka olette seurannut tätä YouTuben kautta ja tätä on ollut mukava päästä keskustelemaan Tomin kanssa ja hienoa, että te olette olleet kuuntelemassa. So, thanks for the audience who has been seeing this and uh, watching our whole conversation. And Tom, I hope hear hear you someday from somewhere, and uh, perhaps I will see you uh, in Finland someday. And if I will, then I will in invite you to the Villa Spirit, where I'm actually making this. This is a retreat center in the uh, eastern part of Finland, which is full of full of lakes. Ah, yeah, lovely. Yes, lovely. Okay, I stop recording now and. Uh, then uh, I'm just uh, see what happens when I uh, leave this meeting. I'm okay. Thank you. You're welcome.